This is Audible. Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Ark of Justice, a saga of race, civil rights, and murder in the Jazz Age, by Kevin Boyle, narrated by Lizanne Mitchell. This book is copyrighted 2004 by Kevin Boyle. This recording is copyrighted 2006 by Recorded Books. The author opens this book with the following two quotes. The first are lines written by abolitionist Theodore Parker sometime in the 1850s. The arc of the moral universe is long. But it bends toward justice. The second quote that opens this book is from a poem by Langston Hughes, written in 1923. That justice is a blind goddess is the thing to which we blacks are wise. Her bandage hides two festering sores that once, perhaps, were eyes. And now, Ark of Justice. Prologue, America, 1925. The migrants filled the train stations of the South every day in the summer of 1925, waiting on ramshackle wooden platforms of crossroads towns such as Opelousas, Louisiana. In Andalusia, Alabama, and in cantilevered caverns such as Atlanta's Union Station, when the northbound trains pulled in, hissing and steaming, the travelers picked up cardboard suitcases bought at five and dimes, or battered trunks carried since freedom came. Summoning up their courage, they strode past the Pullman porters, race men like themselves. Making their way down the platforms to the grimy Jim Crow cars, settling into their seats for the long rides north. The landscapes rolling past the tense faces look familiar. The seas of cotton fields that flowed from the Mississippi River to the Georgia coast, the tobacco plantations that ran from North Carolina to the outskirts of Washington D.C., the squalid lumber camps of East Texas. The black and coal towns of Appalachia, and the rough mill villages of the Carolina Piedmont, every place they passed bore the brand of segregation and the Jim Crow laws. Every station had its whites and coloreds signs hanging above separate waiting rooms. Every view had its hidden terrors. Eight men had been lynched by white mobs in the first half of 1925, a quiet year. By previous standards, black newspapers like the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier had given the atrocities front-page coverage. Porters had tucked the papers into their bags and carried them home to the South, to the barber shops and the road houses, the churches and the cafes. So the travelers had to wonder: Was that collection of sharecroppers' shacks slipping by as the train passed Greenwood, Mississippi? The place where a few months ago a posse murdered Hal Winters because he dared defend his daughter from the landlord's advances, was that gnarled tree on the horizon just beyond Scarborough, Georgia, the site where a mob doused Robert Smith in gasoline and set him ablaze in March. Gradually, the world outside the filthy windows became less and less familiar. At some point, the cotton fields gave way to wheat and corn. The rolling hills of Appalachia sloped into the flatlands of the Midwest. Mining camps gave way to factory towns, where the trains slowed to crawls as they passed mammoth warehouses and crossed street after nameless street. When the trains pulled into the stations here, the migrants saw no signs for whites or coloreds. In the early days of migration during the Great War. Travelers sometimes celebrated crossing into the North by breaking into song or prayer, but so many migrants had made the trip north now, almost a million Southern-born blacks since 1917, that the joy was tempered. 
They knew now that northern whites were as capable of brutality and murder as southern men. Rampaging whites had killed 23 blacks during a week of rioting in Chicago in the bitter summer of 1919. Yet, it was still hard to remain calm as the trains reached the outskirts of one of the great cities, where the industrial districts alone dwarfed anything the South could claim. Gary's vast steelworks, one of the wonders of the modern world, sprawled across the prairie south of Chicago. The streets of Trenton and Hoboken were warrens of tool shops and warehouses. On the banks of the listless Rouge River, just outside Detroit, Henry Ford was building an automobile factory large enough to employ all of Nashville or Norfolk. The migrants grew increasingly excited as the distant, hazy outlines of the downtown skylines appeared. Pillars of steel and glass gradually filled the car's windows. Even the smallest skyscrapers, the 21-story Flatiron Building in Lower Manhattan or the imposing Book Cadillac Hotel in downtown Detroit, would have been landmarks almost anywhere in the South. Here, they faded into the shadows of buildings that seemed to soar upward forever. Chicago's newly opened Wrigley Building stood majestically above the loop, its brilliantly illuminated clock tower drawing all eyes, day or night. In New York, the Woolworth Building's elegant terracotta facade reached almost 800 feet into the sky, higher than any other building in the world. Behind those structures rose the skeletons of the next generation of skyscrapers, sure to be even taller, even more stunning. The nation's cities sparkled in the summer of 1925. New York and Chicago, with more than two million residents each, were among the largest cities in the Western world, while Detroit, home to the fabulous new auto industry, was America's great boom town, an industrial juggernaut of unprecedented power. Europe's cultural hegemony had died in the course of the Great War, its lifeblood drained away in the mud of Flanders' fields. Urban America filled the void, drowning out the Ancien Regime's death knell with the pounding of the jackhammer and the riotous joy of the jazz band. New York, Chicago, and Detroit coursed with cash in the mid-twenties. The war had made the United States the world's banker, the great American investment houses, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, managed staggering sums, pouring international wealth into the soaring stock market and swelling corporate coffers. Manufacturers pushed their companies to new heights. Backed by the investment houses, many consolidated their operations. By the summer of 1925, the economy was awash in mergers, each larger and more spectacular than the last. Sprawling factories, marvels of machinery, poured out wonderful new products as merchants battled to build the grand stores befitting them. In 1924, Macy's completed additions that brought its floor space to two million square feet. The next spring, Detroit's leading retailer, J.L. Hudson, launched construction of a store 21 stories high, the world's tallest, and as lavish as anything Macy's or Marshall Fields could muster. The cities literally glowed with salesmanship, the new science of the 1920s. In the spring of 1925, a giant Moses towered over Times Square, advertising Cecil B. DeMille's epic, The Ten Commandments. Every few minutes, a flash of electric light struck the tablets he held over his head. The city's sparkle wasn't simply financial. It was also cultural. Massive immigration in the late 19th century had made the major urban centers strikingly polyglot places. By the turn of the century, the foreign-born and their children far outnumbered the native-born in almost every large city. The war slowed the mass migration from Europe, but it launched the great migration of Negroes from the South. There were 5,700 blacks living in Detroit in 1910, 91,000 in New York. Fifteen years later, Detroit had 81,000 colored citizens, New York almost 300,000. The flood of people, foreign-born and native-born, white and black, 
fit no single profile. Some of the newcomers were learned. Others couldn't read or write. Some had spent their lives in cities. Others had never been beyond the boundaries of their villages. A minority were professionals, businessmen and teachers, doctors and lawyers, priests, ministers and rabbis. Most were working people who filled the factories, built the homes, scrubbed the floors, and nursed the babies of the well-to-do. These new residents brought more than brawn to the cities, though. They brought their religions, their politics, their institutions, and their art. They jammed the city streets on the feast days of their village saints, and they emptied them on the Day of Atonement. They talked of revolution in the cafes of Greenwich Village and of patronage politics in the saloons of working-class Chicago. They opened tiny storefront churches and substantial fraternal lodges. They rushed to the vaudeville theaters where Jewish entertainers honed their craft and into the ghetto dance halls where ragtime bands pushed the boundaries of American music. And they elbowed their way into the city's public life. By the early 1900s, ethnic politicians filled city council seats and mayor's offices in city after city. At first, native-born Americans were almost universally appalled by the world that the black and white migrants were building on the Lower East Side of New York or Chicago's back of the yards. In the early days of the 20th century, though, a tiny number of sophisticates embraced immigrant working-class life as an antidote to the poisonous constraints of Victorian bourgeois culture. The first wave were artists enthralled by the color, the noise, the sheer vitality of the immigrant wards and determined to weave that life into an art that defined the modern and a politics that fostered liberation. In the 1920s, slumming became a mania, and urban elites sought out the exotic, the real, wherever they could find it. They packed into the speakeasies that filled the cities after the imposition of prohibition, where they could rub shoulders with the Italian, Irish, or Jewish gangsters. They filled theaters to see ethnic entertainers, such as ragtime Jimmy Durante, late of Coney Island, or the anarchic Marx Brothers. And in the most startling turn of them all, they discovered the Negroes living in their midst. In the early 1920s, sophisticates scrambled to grab a share of the black life that the Southern migration was bringing into the cities. White producers mounted all black musicals, white couples fumbled with the Charleston, and white patrons poured into Chicago's South Side jazz joints and Harlem's nightclubs. If they were lucky, they squeezed into the Von Dome where Louis Armstrong held the floor, or Edmund Seller, where Ethel Waters sang the blues. The frenzy was shot through with condescension. White slummers thought black life exciting because it was primitive and vital. Visiting the ghetto's haunts became the era's way to snub mainstream society, to be in the avant-garde. Jazz, the blues, Negro spirituals all stimulate me enormously, Novelist Carl Van Vechten wrote H. L. Mencken in the summer of 1924. Doubtless, I shall discard them, too, in time. When the trains pulled into their terminals, the migrants jostled against one another as they began to gather up their belongings. Finally, they filed onto platforms, already mobbed with passengers and porters, Many must have paused, unsure of what to do and where to go, then simply decided to follow the flow of people up the stairs to the station's grand concourses. They were faced for the first time with the grandeur of the city. Detroit's Michigan Central Station was a Beaux-Arts masterpiece, a four-story colonnade dominated by a sequence of ornate arches and glittering chandeliers. The rotunda of the Illinois Central Station, built to awe visitors to Chicago's legendary World's Fair of 1893, was swathed in a marble wainscoting 14 feet high. But nothing surpassed the great terminals of Gotham. Penn Station, with its main concourse sheathed in soaring steel and glass, 
and Grand Central Station, its great hall flooded with light from three monumental arched windows, its vaulted ceiling decorated by massive murals of the constellations. You can identify the boys and girls from the country if you stand in Grand Central and watch their behavior as they step from the train, National Geographic reported. They hesitate a moment, oblivious to the crowds looking upward, gripping their bags and bundles, hearing New York sensing it. If they were lucky, the newcomers had friends or relatives waiting. They'd scour the crowds for familiar faces or hope to hear some voice calling their name, some voice they prayed they still might recognize. There would be moments of reunion, hands outstretched in greeting, the sudden comforts of warm embraces. Others had no one to meet them. How terrifying it must have been to work through the waves of people alone, to step through the terminal's doors and onto the streets without a guide. The Illinois Central stood at the southern end of Chicago's Grant Park, just outside the Loop. Detroit Station faced a large park, ringed by hotels and boarding houses, and beyond that, Michigan Avenue, the busiest thoroughfare on the city's west side. Penn Station fronted bustling 7th Avenue, while Grand Central stood just 12 blocks away, facing elegant Park Avenue. All the streets pulsed with energy. Pedestrians, newsboys, shoeshine men, and red caps crowded the sidewalks. Cabbies jockeyed for fares. Automobile horns blasted as drivers battled for places at the curb. Streetcars clanged by, jammed with riders. In the clamor, no one paid attention to a colored man or woman standing alone, wondering where to go and how to make his way in a new America. American cities didn't simply sparkle in the summer of 1925. They simmered with hatred, deeply divided as always. Native-born Americans had been denouncing foreigners since the first wave of immigrants. The ragged refugees of blighted Ireland poured into the cities in the desperate days of the 1840s. Time and again in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, urban whites proved themselves capable of savagery toward their black neighbors. But no matter how deep their divisions, the cities never developed the formal systems of segregation perfected in the South. Then came the Jazz Age, and suddenly the very changes that made the city glitter triggered a backlash so bitter that the nation's great metropolises skidded toward their own version of Jim Crow. The backlash was fueled by fear of moral decay. Many native-born whites were appalled by the city's celebration of immigrant and black cultures, with its implicit condemnation of traditional standards and its unmistakable whiff of amalgamation. Political conflict and economic strain made the backlash even more incendiary. For the better part of a generation, native-born politicians had been trying to check ethnic influence in city governments. Their efforts were driven partly by self-interest, partly by their belief that politicians of immigrant stock simply weren't capable of providing disinterested public service. Calvin Coolidge, a dour Yankee from the tiny hamlet of Plymouth Notch, Vermont, had been propelled to national prominence in 1919, when as governor of Massachusetts, he had broken a strike by the overwhelmingly Irish Catholic Boston police. Four years later, he became president of the United States, but his confrontation with the Boston cops still haunted him. The unassimilated alien child menaces our children, he told the readers of Good Housekeeping, as the alien industrial worker who has destruction rather than production in mind menaces our industry. Politicians weren't alone in sounding the alarm. From his opulent estate just outside Detroit, Henry Ford raged against Jewish bankers and their Bolshevik allies who were conspiring to destroy all that Anglo-Saxon businessmen had built. His fury 
tinged with the longing for those halcyon days when immigrants and Negroes knew their place. At least Ford had his millions to console him. Many native-born whites didn't have wealth or power to buffer them from the changes sweeping over the cities. They were solid citizens, school teachers and shopkeepers, office workers and factory foremen, tradesmen and housewives, and they'd worked hard to build a secure and respectable life for their families. Many resented the foreigners who intruded on their world. Now the cities were filling with Negroes as well, a race many native-born whites considered even more degraded than the wretched refuse of Europe's teeming shores. Everyone knew that Negroes were a breed apart, they said, charming in their simplicity, but also frightening in their volatility, their carnality, their utter incapacity to learn the lessons of civilized society. It hadn't been so bad when only a few blacks lived in the city, but now they were everywhere, walking the streets, riding the streetcars, looking for jobs and houses that put them alongside decent white people. In the early 1920s, native-born whites braced themselves against the threats the city posed. Shopkeepers' associations mounted boycotts against foreign-born competitors. Church groups campaigned against lewd entertainment and demanded that prohibition be enforced. Veterans' organizations tried to purge public schools of textbooks that didn't celebrate Anglo-Saxon culture with sufficient fervor. Foremen and tradesmen used their lodge halls to prevent immigrants and Negroes from gaining access to the better-paying factory jobs. And thousands of people poured into the newest and most exciting of the city's many fraternal clubs, the Ku Klux Klan which had been revived by D.W. Griffith's 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, appealed to the Reconstruction Era KKK. The founders of the new clan were businessmen, pure and simple, who stood for 100% Americanism. They protected traditional morality. They defended the virtue of white womanhood, assailed bootleggers and their besotted clients celebrated sobriety and the triumph of a Protestant God. They made sure that all those who threatened the nation, blacks of course, but also Catholics, Jews, and the foreign-born, were kept in their place. It was a brilliant sales job. In the early 1920s, the Klan broke out of its southern base, racing through the small towns of the Midwest and West, and it absolutely exploded in the big cities. By 1924, Detroit's Klan had 35,000 members, Chicago's 50,000. The money rolled in for memberships, robes, rule books, and the hatred spewed out from the Klan rallies and marches, protests, and political campaigns that spread across urban America. The anger seething up from the streets blended with the fears of the well-heeled to create a fierce political movement. But the combination wasn't stable. Powerful men like Coolidge and Ford weren't always comfortable with the hoi polloi of white America. When 50,000 Klansmen in full regalia paraded past the White House in August 1925, Coolidge snubbed them. But Anglo-Saxon politicians and businessmen also found plenty of common ground with their robed brethren. The nativists' campaign reached high tide in 1924. Anti-immigrant groups had been demanding for years that Congress restrict entry into the United States. The pressure became intense in the early 1920s. Veterans' groups lobbied their representatives. The Klan launched a massive letter-writing campaign. Businessmen endorsed restriction and nativist scientists and authors appeared before congressional committees to explain the growing threat to the American racial stock. Congress finally surrendered in the spring of 1924. The National Origins Act imposed such strict limits on the number of immigrants allowed into the country that for all intents and purposes, it ended the great era of immigration, now eight decades old. Ethnic spokesmen pleaded with the president to veto the bill, but Coolidge remained silent, as was his habit. The nativists followed up their triumph in Congress 
with a raw display of political power. It was a presidential election year in 1924. When the Republicans met at their convention, a few delegates proposed that the GOP condemn Klan intolerance. But the invisible empire's influence was so strong that the proposal went down in flames. The Democrats' convention, held at Madison Square Garden, took an even more bitter turn. For some time, the governor of New York, Al Smith, had been positioning himself to run for the presidency. Smith was a first-rate politician, but he was also an Irish Catholic, the son of working-class parents, born in a third-floor walk-up on the Lower East Side, educated in the Fulton Street fish market and the smoke-filled rooms of Tammany Hall. The party's nativists were apoplectic at the thought of such a man in the White House, so they deadlocked the convention. Ballot after ballot, Smith's supporters and opponents battle over the nomination. At one point in the proceedings, William Jennings Bryan, the ancient populist turned champion of traditional values, stood up to address the convention. The Smith supporters in the gallery, New York's aspiring ethnics, showered him with catcalls. He raised his leonine head to them. You, he shouted in the voice that had thrilled generations, do not represent the future of our country. So it seemed. After 103 ballots, Smith and his immigrant world went down to defeat. The city's white supremacists never had such signal victories. Their campaigns were more local, their initiatives more piecemeal, but they were in their own way even more sweeping than those of the nativists. No one outside the South suggested that the flow of blacks into the cities be prohibited. Bit by bit, however, urban whites carved a color line through the city. When the migration northward began during the war, blacks had been able to find a range of factory jobs. The opportunities shrank in the early 1920s, as many employers decided that all but the most menial and dangerous work should be reserved for whites. More and more white shopkeepers banned black customers from their stores and restaurants. And, most ominously, whites decided that blacks couldn't live wherever they wanted. They were to be hidden away in a handful of neighborhoods walled into ghettos. Businessmen infused the real estate market with racist rules and regulations. White landlords wouldn't show black tenants apartments outside the ghetto. White real estate agents wouldn't show them houses in white neighborhoods. Bankers wouldn't offer them mortgages. Insurance agents wouldn't provide them with coverage. Developers wrote legal restrictions into their deeds, barring blacks from new housing tracts. As the structures of segregation hardened, white homeowners became more and more determined to protect their neighborhood's racial purity. Those whites who could afford to do so left the ghetto. Those who had no black neighbors organized to keep their areas lily white. They formed legal organizations, protective associations they called them, to write clauses into their deeds prohibiting the sale of their homes to blacks. They monitored real estate sales to make sure no one broke the color line. And if a black family somehow managed to breach the defenses, they could always drive them out, quietly if possible, violently if necessary. The cities weren't segregated in one quick rush. White real estate agents, bankers, and homeowners had begun shaping Chicago's ghetto in the first decade of the 20th century. White Detroiters didn't follow their example until the late 1910s and early 1920s. What's more, no one coordinated the businessmen's practices and the homeowners' actions. They spread by quiet agreement, sealed by a handshake in the boardroom, a directive from the home office, a conversation over coffee in the neighbor's kitchen. But the forces of the marketplace have a way of imposing discipline on disparate behaviors. By the summer of 1925, racial restrictions 
were assuming the power of convention across the urban north. As they did, the glittering cities of the Jazz Age were inexorably being divided in two. The migrants knew about the ghettos. Sometimes they just knew a name, Harlem, Chicago's Black Belt, Detroit's Black Bottom, sometimes even less. A direction from the train station, a stop on the streetcar line, an address committed to memory. So they set out for the subway line that ran uptown, the State Street L to the south side of Chicago, or the Michigan Avenue streetcar to Detroit's east side, hoping that this was the correct place to go, that these trains were the last trains of a journey that seemed to be stretching on and on. Racial etiquette heightened the tension. Southern whites expected blacks to be obsequious. Would northern whites expect the same? What would happen if they accidentally brushed against a white woman in the crush to board the subway train? Could they take the empty seat toward the front of the car as they had been told they could? Or would it be better to sit in the back and avoid even the possibility of a confrontation? There was only a split second to make a decision that, if wrong, might have catastrophic consequences. The ride across town must have seemed terribly long. The subway trains rumbled in and out of darkness. The streetcars clattered through the crowded streets. Finally, the migrants saw the stop they'd been waiting for, at 125th Street on the rim of Harlem, at South State and 26th Street, on St. Antoine Street in the heart of Black Bottom. As the trains rumbled away without them, the migrants turned toward the dazzling lights, the main thoroughfares were magical places. Newcomers were amazed by the sweep of black-owned businesses, restaurants, barbershops, pool halls, cabarets, blind pigs, gambling joints, camouflaged as recreation clubs, a migrant to Detroit remembered. They were awed by the street life, by the pushcart vendors hawking fresh fruits and vegetables, by the street corner orators selling socialism, separatism, or salvation, by the jazz and blues clubs, pitching their performers to the locals and the slummers. What a city! What a world! Thrilled poet Arna Bontam upon his arrival in Harlem in 1924. But the migrants couldn't live in the stores and the nightclubs. No matter how entranced they might be, they eventually had to leave the gaudy brilliance of the business strips and head down the side streets in search of housing. There were a handful of attractive streets, like Harlem's 138th and 139th, Strivers Row. For the most part, though, the glamour of the main streets gave way to poverty. Knowing that the migrants had nowhere else to go, landlords had carved Harlem's brownstones and the working men's cottage of Black Bottom and the Black Belt into tiny apartments, which they rented at exorbitant rates. The prophets rarely found their way back into the buildings. Paint peeled from the clabbards. Broken windows remained unmended. Leaky roofs unrepaired. As they took in the sights, many migrants sagged with disappointment. But they knew they had few alternatives. So they simply trudged on, looking for the address they'd been given, for a rooming house where they could spend the night, for a flat they could make their own, trying to find a home better than the one they'd left behind. Chapter One Where Death Waits The streets of Detroit shimmered with heat. Most years, autumn arrived the first week of September. Not in 1925. Two days past Labor Day and the sun blazed like July. Heat curled up from the asphalt, wrapped around the telephone poles and streetlight stanchions, drifted past the unmarked doors of darkened speakeasies, seeped through windows thrown open to catch a breeze, and settled into the city's flats and houses where it lay, thick and oppressive, as afternoon edged into evening.' 
Detroit had been an attractive place in the 19th century. A medium-sized Midwestern city made graceful by its founder's French design. Five broad boulevards radiated outward like the spokes of a wheel, each one running east, northeast, north, northwest, and west from the compact downtown. Detroit's grand promenades, these boulevards were lined with the mansions of the well-to-do, mammoth stone churches, imposing businesses, and exclusive clubs. Between the boulevards lay Detroit's neighborhoods, row after row of modest single-family homes interspersed with empty lots, waiting for the development that boosters continually claimed was coming but never seemed to arrive. The auto boom changed everything. Plenty of cities had automakers in the early days, but Detroit had the young industry's geniuses, practical men seduced by the beauty of well-ordered mechanical systems and fascinated by the challenge of efficiency. German and French manufacturers had invented automobiles in the 1870s. It was Detroit's brilliance to reinvent them. In the early days of the 20th century, the city's aspiring automakers had disassembled the European-made horseless carriages, studying every part, tinkering with the designs, searching for ways to make them work more smoothly and to manufacture them more cheaply. By 1914, when Henry Ford unveiled his restructured Highland Park plant north of downtown, the process was complete. Ford had created a factory as complex as the automobile itself, floor after floor full of machines intricately designed and artfully arranged to make and assemble auto parts faster than anyone thought possible. 300,000 Model Ts rolled out of the factory that year, inexpensive, elegantly simple, utterly dependable cars for ordinary folk like Ford himself. Ford's triumph triggered the industrial version of a gold rush. Other manufacturers grabbed great parcels of land for factories. The Dodge brothers, John and Horace, started work on a complex large enough to rival Ford's on the northeast side. Walter Chrysler built a sprawling plant on the far reaches of the east side, near the Detroit River. Walter O. Briggs scattered a series of factories across the city. Aspiring entrepreneurs filled the side streets with tiny machine shops and parts plants that they hoped would earn them a cut of the seemingly unending profits. The frenzy transformed Detroit itself into a great machine. By 1925, its grand boulevards were shadowed by stark factory walls and canopied by tangles of telephone lines and streetcar cables. Once fine buildings were now enveloped in a perpetual haze from dozens of coal-fired furnaces. More than a decade had passed since Henry Ford, desperate to keep his workers on the line, doubled their wages to an unprecedented $5 a day. Word of Detroit's high-paying jobs had shot through the Pennsylvania mining camps, British shipyards, Mississippi farmhouses, and peasant villages from Sonora to Abruzzi. Tens of thousands of working people poured into the city, lining up at the factory gates, looking for their share of the machinist's dream. Eleven years on, they were still coming. In 1900, when Ford was first organizing his company, Detroit had 285,000 people living within its city limits. By 1925, it had 1.25 million only New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia were bigger, and Detroit was rapidly closing the gap. Detroit is El Dorado, wrote an awed magazine reporter. It is staccato American. It is shockingly dynamic. And it was completely overwhelming. While the auto magnates retreated to the serenity of their sparkling new suburban estates, Working people struggle to hold on to a sliver of space somewhere in Detroit's vast grid of smoke-gray side streets. In the center city, where Negroes and the poorest immigrants lived, 
Two, three, or more families shared tiny workmen's cottages built generations before. Single men jammed into desperately overcrowded rooming houses, sleeping in shifts so that landlords could double the fees they collected for the privilege of eight hours' rest on flea-infested mattresses. Beyond the inner ring, a mile or so from downtown, the 19th century gradually gave way to a sprawl of new neighborhoods. First came vast tracts of flats and jerry-rigged houses for those members of the working class lucky enough to find five-dollar-a-day jobs. Immigrants clustered on the east side of the city, the native-born on the west side, all of them paying premium prices for homes slapped up amid factories, warehouses, and rail yards, or along barren streetscapes. Workers' neighborhoods blended almost imperceptibly into areas dominated by craftsmen and clerks, Detroit's solid middle strata, who struggle mightily to afford the tiny touches that set them apart from the masses, a bit of distance from the factory gates, a patch of grass front and back. Finally, out near the suburbs' borders lay pockets of comfortable middle-class houses, miniature versions of the mock Tudors and colonial revivals favored by the upper crust, so beyond the means of most Detroiters it wasn't even worth the effort of dreaming about them. Garland Avenue set squarely in the middle range, four miles east of downtown, halfway between the squalor of the inner city and the splendor of suburban Gross Point. Despite its name, it wasn't an avenue at all. It was just a side street, two miles of pavement, running straight north from Jefferson Avenue, Detroit's southeastern boulevard, to Gratiot Avenue, the northeastern boulevard. In 1900, Garland was nothing more than a plan on a plat book, but developers had raced to fill it in. To squeeze out every bit of space, they cut the street into long blocks, broken by cross streets that could serve as business strips. Then they sliced each block into 20 or 30 thin lots, 35 feet wide and 125 feet deep. A few plots were sold to families who wanted to build their own homes, the way working people always used to do. On the remaining lots, developers built utilitarian houses for the middling sort. Long, narrow, wood frame, two family flats, one apartment up, another down, each with its own entrance off a porch that ran the length of the front. Behind each house was a small yard, barely big enough for a garden, leading out to the alleyway. In front was a postage stamp lawn running from the porch to the spindly elms planted at curbside. Only a few feet of open space separated one building from another, a space so small that from the right angle, the houses seemed to fade one into another, much as one machine seemed to fade into another along an assembly line. The people who lived up and down the street didn't have the education, the credentials, or the polish of the lawyers, accountants, and college professors who lived in the city's outer reaches. But they had all the attributes necessary to keep themselves out of the inner city, and that's what mattered most. Of course, they were white, each and every one. The vast majority of them were American-born, and the few foreigners living on the street came from respectable stock. They were Germans, Englishmen, Irishmen, and Scotsmen, not the Poles or Russians or Greeks who filled so much of the East Side. Some of them were native Detroiters, and virtually all the rest had come to the city from other northern states, so they knew how to make their way in the big city. They understood how to work their way into the trades, how to use a membership in the Masons or the Odd Fellows to pry open employment office doors, how to flash a bit of fast talk to sway a reluctant buyer. Such advantages helped the people of Garland find solid jobs, a blessing in a city that burned through working men, then tossed them aside. A minority of the men worked as salesmen, teachers, and shop clerks, 
the sort of jobs that didn't pay particularly well, but kept the hands clean. A few more were craftsmen, the elite of the working class, trained in metalwork or carpentry or machine repair, and fiercely proud of the knowledge they carried under their cloth caps. Many more had clawed their way to the top rung of factory labor. They were foremen, inspectors, supervisors, men who spent their days in the noise and dirt of the shop floor, making sure that others did the back-breaking, mind-numbing work required to keep shiny new cars flowing out of the factories. Most of the women worked at home. They rose early to make husbands and boarders breakfasts sufficient to steal them for a day of work, then bustle children off to school, the youngest to Julia Ward Howe Elementary, a brooding two-story brick building at the intersection of Garland and Charlevoix, three blocks north of Jefferson. The older ones to Foch Middle School and Southeastern High. Mornings and afternoons were spent shopping and sweeping and washing clothes streaked with machine oil and alley dirt. Their evenings were devoted to cooking and cleaning dishes while their husbands relaxed with the newspaper or puttered out in the garage. No matter how many advantages the families along Garland Avenue enjoyed, though, it was always a struggle to hold on. Housing prices had spiraled upward so fearfully, the only way a lot of folks could buy a flat or a house was to take on a crippling burden of debt. The massive weight of double mortgages or usurious land contracts threatened to crack family budgets. Men feared the unexpected assault on incomes that at their best barely covered monthly payments, the commission that failed to come through, the rebellious work crew that cost a foreman his job, the sudden recession that shuttered factories for a few weeks. And now they faced this terrible turn of events. Negroes were moving onto the street, breaking into white man's territory. News of their arrival meant so many things. A man felt his pride knotted and twisted. Parents feared for the safety of their daughters, who had to walk the same streets as colored men. And everyone knew that when the color line was breached, housing values would collapse, spinning downward, until Garland Avenue was swallowed into the ghetto and everything was lost. Word that a colored family had bought the bungalow on the northwest corner of Garland and Charlevoix had first spread up and down the street in the early days of summer. The place was Kitty Corner to the elementary school and directly across Garland from the Morning Star Market, the cramped neighborhood grocery where many of the women did their daily shopping. The rumors had caused a lot of consternation, much tough talk, and some serious threats. But most people were still surprised when the day after Labor Day, policemen took up positions around the house. The Negroes had arrived in the morning, half a dozen of them. Since they didn't have much furniture, they'd finished the move in no time at all. But the police had stayed all day and into the night. They returned first thing the next morning. A couple of patrolmen wandered listlessly back and forth along the blistering sidewalk as school let out at 3.15. An even larger official presence was in position, eight officers stationed around the intersection, when the men came home from the factories a few hours later. Garland wasn't a friendly street. Neighbors might nod as they went to work, chat in line at the market. Kids might play together. But there were a few too many transients. A young couple renting out a flat, a single man boarding in a back bedroom, for folks to really feel connected to one another. Even long-time residents generally kept to themselves. On the evening of September 9, 1925, though, neighbors couldn't wait to get outside. Partly, it was the soaring temperatures that drew them down to the street, but it was the pulsing energy the surging excitement that really tugged at them. The Negroes were nowhere to be seen. There were no lights burning in the bungalow, no sign of movement anywhere on the property. But everyone knew they were in there. 
and everyone knew that the police were stationed out front because there might be trouble. So people finished up their suppers and one by one drifted out to Garland. It was close to seven when Ray and Kathleen Dove brought their baby daughter onto the porch of their flat, almost directly across from the colored family's house. Ray had spent the day in the Murray body plant up near the Ford factory where he worked as a metal finisher. It was a sweaty, dangerous job, grinding down the imperfections in steel auto bodies, making them as smooth as customers expected them to be. As usual, Ray came home anxious for an evening of relaxation. Kathleen sat in the chair she brought outside, and Ray leaned against the railing, watching the baby play at his feet. Their two boarders, George Strausser and Bill Arthur, soon joined them. Strausser kept himself occupied by writing a letter. Arthur, only three days in the neighborhood, was content to sit with his landlords and pass the time while the sun slowly set. As they chatted, the sidewalk in front of the Dove's house began to fill up with excited neighborhood children. Thirteen-year-old George Suppers dragged his little brother down the street as soon as they had finished their after-dinner chores. He met his best friend, Ulrich Arthur, in front of the market. The three boys stood around for a while watching the corner store until a cop told them to move on. Then they wandered over to the Dove's front lawn, where no one seemed to care how long they loitered. Most adults wouldn't admit to sharing the kids' curiosity, so those anxious to be outside fished for excuses. Leon Briner, a foreman at the Continental Motors plant, lived a dozen houses north of the Doves, in a frame cottage much more modest than the bungalow the Negroes had bought. He had good reason to stay at home. His wife, Leona, suffered from a heart condition, and the heat left her drained and often cross. But Branner grew restless sitting alongside her in the rockers they had on their small front porch, and he volunteered to pick up a few items from the Morning Star Market down at the corner. Puffing on his pipe, he headed down toward the police. Otto Lemhagen arrived at the corner shortly after seven to spend some time with his brother-in-law, Norton Shooknecht, a man of stature, an inspector in the Detroit Police Department, commander of the McClellan Avenue Station. This was all very impressive to Lem Hagen, who in his career had risen all the way to investigator at the telephone company. Garland lay within Shooknecks' precinct, so Lem Hagen knew his brother-in-law would be spending the evening out at the colored's house, making sure nothing untoward happened. Lem Hagen sidled up to him while he stood kitty corner from the bungalow, chatting with his lieutenant. While the two men passed the time, Garland took on the feel of a carnival. Traffic was growing heavier, and there were knots of people in the schoolyard, maybe twenty, thirty people or more, mostly women and children. Some sat on the lawn. A few tossed a baseball around on the gravel playground. More neighbors meandered up and down Garland or Charlevoix, sometimes alone, other times in small groups although Shooknecks' patrolmen weren't allowing any of them onto the sidewalk directly in front of the Negro's house. There was an air of good humor on the corner, an easy sociability that Garland Avenue rarely experienced. People talked about mundane matters, the weather, their summer vacations, the new school year. But Lemhagen also caught snatches of bitterness, seething through the growing crowd. Damn funny thing he heard someone on the schoolyard say that the police wouldn't go in there and drag those niggers out. Eric Hoberg felt that same mix of bonhomie and anger as he made his way home from work a few minutes later. The 22-year-old plumber, an angular young man with ears too large for his long, thin face, rented a room in the upstairs flat next door to the Doves. He knew that the Negro's presence riled people. Hadn't his landlady greeted him at the door yesterday afternoon with the taunt. You got new neighbors over there. That's the nigger people. That's the people trying to move in over there. Hauberg wasn't the sort of man who went looking for trouble. But he couldn't resist the pull of the street, the chance to break his routine, to share the warm night air with people like himself. So he rushed upstairs to grab a bite to eat and to clean up, a quick wash, a shave, a new set of clothes,
It was a bit of vanity, that's all. He wanted to wipe away the grime of the day, to look his best. Who knew what might happen on a night like this? By 5.30, the late summer sun was already starting to sink toward the row of tightly packed houses. The light that had been filtering through the drawn curtains began to fade. But the gathering darkness did nothing to dissipate the heat that had built up over the course of the day. With the windows barely cracked open and the doors shut fast, the bungalow on the corner was enveloped in a suffocating stillness. Dr. Ashen Sweet sat at the card table he'd set up in the dining room. He was a handsome man, short, dark, and powerfully built. A month short of thirty, he looked ten years older. His hairline was receding, his waistline expanding. His face was taking on the roundness of middle age. Other men might have hated to see their youth slipping from them. Sweet cultivated the illusion of maturity. Where he came from, black men were permanently boys, never worthy of white men's respect, never their equals. Dr. Sweet was no boy. He was a professional man, better educated, wealthier, more accomplished than most of the whites he encountered. He wanted others to know it the moment they saw him. So he favored suits, well-cut and subdued. He bought crisp white shirts and tasteful ties. He wore the round tortoiseshell glasses popular with college men. He kept his mustache neatly trimmed, his hair stylishly short. Sweet attempted to project the casual confidence, the instinctual authority that set doctors apart from the ordinary run of men. It didn't come to him naturally. As a child, he had shared in the back-breaking work of his parents' central Florida farm, tending to the fields his father rented, hauling water from the streams so that his mother could do the laundry, caring for the ever-growing brood of brothers and sisters who filled every cranny of the tiny farmhouse his parents had built by hand. His mother and father had taught him what they could, immersing him in the religious traditions that had sustained the family through generations of struggle, making him want to succeed. Then, when he was thirteen years old, they had sent Ashin away, not because they wanted one less mouth to feed, though lifting that burden was a blessing, but because they loved him. Get away while you're young, they told him. Go north. Get an education. And he did. Though he left Florida with only as much as he could glean from six years in a one-room schoolhouse that shut down when harvest time came. It took him twelve more years to fulfill his parents' instructions, a dozen long, hard years of schooling to master the material that would make him an educated man and earn the pride that was expected of the race's best men, all the while working as a serving boy for white people, washing dirty dishes, waiting tables, carting luggage up hotel stairs just to pay tuition and buy the books his professors required him to read. Ashia never excelled, but he got an education, as fine an education as almost any man in America, colored or white, could claim. By age 25, he had earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Wilberforce University in Ohio and his medical degree from Washington, D.C.'s Howard University, the jewel in the crown of Negro colleges. He'd come to Detroit in 1921 with virtually nothing, but in the four years since then, He'd built a thriving practice down in Black Bottom, the city's largest ghetto. He'd earned the respect of his colleagues at Dunbar Memorial, the city's best colored hospital. He'd helped his brother Otis launch his professional career. Best of all, Ashin had found in his wife Gladys a young woman of grace, charm, and social standing, a wonderfully suitable doctor's wife. As a gift to them both, and a balm for their pain, Ashen had taken his bride on the sort of adventure one reads about in novels. A year-long stay in Vienna and Paris, where he completed postgraduate studies on the cutting edge of medical science. Yet, despite all those victories, Ashen remained, deep down, the frightened Florida farm boy trying to carry his family's expectations 
on his narrow shoulders. He didn't doubt his abilities. He knew he was a fine physician better than most. But he often tried too hard to impress, to find just the right phrase, to strike just the right pose, to keep just the right distance, to reassure himself. Now, as the darkness slowly descended around him, his carefully constructed veneer crumbled away. He didn't feel sure of himself. He felt terribly, terribly afraid. This house was supposed to have been one more grand accomplishment. Ashen and Gladys had first seen the bungalow in late May 1925. She loved it from the start. A city girl, born in Pittsburgh, raised in a small but comfortable house in Detroit, only a few miles north of Garland, Gladys knew quality when she saw it. She desperately wanted a home with a yard where Iva, their 14-month-old daughter, could play. This house had much more to offer as well. The first-floor brick still had the sharply defined edges of new construction. The shingles above were newly painted. The front porch, shaded by the sloping roof, looked so cool and inviting. Gladys could imagine long evenings there, sitting on the swing, talking, and reading. The interior was, if anything, even more attractive. The original owner, a Belgian-born contractor by the name of Decroit, had built it for his family and obviously had wanted the best. The first floor had the cool elegance of the arts and crafts style. Polished oak trim framed the long living room and the dining room behind it. Solid squared pillars stood on either side of the archway that divided the two rooms. A built-in hutch, glass-fronted doors above, generous drawers below, dominated the dining room's far wall. On the opposite side of the room, small built-in bookcases nestled into the base of the pillars echoed the effect of compact craftsmanship that the hutch created. Gladys reveled in the small touches. The flower pattern on the decorative tiles surrounding the gas fireplace in the living room. The leaded glass windows on the south side. The stylish chandelier hanging low in the dining room the small alcove that extended from the same room. This would be the place to put the piano she envisioned them having, the place where she would recreate the music that had always filled her parents' home. Gladys had been thrilled by the spaciousness, so welcome after months of making do at her mother's house. Truth be told, she was pleased that her home had one more room than her mother's. She was moving up, ever so slightly, the way the next generation was supposed to do. Iva could have her own room. She and Ashian would take the front bedroom, overlooking Garland for themselves. It was small, barely big enough for a bed and a dresser. But they'd get the morning sun streaming in through the three dormers, and they'd avoid the late-night noise on Charlevoix, where the streetcar ran. Ashian also liked the house. Maybe not for the stylish touches, though he was a stylish man, but for the message the house delivered. Most Negroes lived in Black Bottom on the eastern end of downtown Detroit. When he first came to the city, Ashen had lived there himself. But established physicians, doctors with solid practices and families to raise, almost always lived in better neighborhoods. And Ashen wanted nothing less for his young family. He deserved a home such as this, the newest, most impressive house on the block. But Ashen also saw the dangers he would be facing if they moved here. He had already seen what white men could do, and sometimes the memories grabbed hold of him. He could see himself as a small boy again, listening to the terrifying stories of colored men mutilated and murdered at the phosphate pits just outside his hometown. With terrifying clarity, he could still see the mob of whites, hundreds and hundreds of them, gathered around that black boy, Fred Rochelle, the one who lived a few blocks from the Sweet family who had been accused of raping a white girl. He could pick out the individuals amid the throng, ordinary people from the white side of town, the jeweler, the livery owner, the butcher, 
their faces alight with anticipation as they waited for the moment when the torch met the pyre and the flames began to lick at Rochelle's battered body. Then the memories flashed to another time, another place, so far from Florida and yet so similar. Ashen could see the gangs of white soldiers and sailors roaming the streets of Washington, D.C. the summer after the war, looking for Negroes to maim and kill, marching up 7th Street toward Howard University, toward the medical school, toward Ashen himself. He could see them coming for him. Ashen's status wouldn't protect him. He knew that. He read the atrocities that the race papers reported, he knew that social standing hadn't protected the four Johnson brothers, one a doctor like Ashen, another a dentist like Otis, riddled with bullets while sitting handcuffed in the back seat of a sheriff's automobile in the woods of Arkansas in 1919. It hadn't saved A.C. Jackson, the colored doctor shot down like a dog, his chest ripped open by a shotgun blast during the Tulsa riot in 1921. It hadn't saved the prosperous little town of Rosewood, Florida, a couple hours north of Ashen's hometown, when a rumor of rape triggered a white pogrom in January 1923. No one could say how many colored people died that day. A dozen, two dozen bodies had been dumped in unmarked graves. But Rosewood was gone, burned to the ground, its survivors scattered to the winds. No, Ashen's hard-won status wouldn't shield him at all if white people on Garland Avenue decided that they didn't want him as a neighbor. Still, it was hard to resist, to walk away, to just give up. Gladys had been so pleased with the bungalow, he didn't want to disappoint her or to let her see how terrified he was by the thought of moving in. Others encouraged him as well. His friend and colleague, Dr. Edward Carter insisted that the purchase was a straightforward business proposition. Real estate was a good investment in a city like Detroit, he said, and a man of Ashen's age, health, and earning power shouldn't be afraid of debt. Ashen knew that he'd have to stretch to make the purchase. He had to pay far more than the neighborhood standard. The owner, Mrs. Smith, was asking $18,500 dollars, as whites always charged black home buyers a premium but he could rent out two of the bedrooms. His brother Otis needed a place to stay, and there were plenty of other colored men who'd be happy to pay for a room in such a house. So he set his fears aside. On the 5th of June, he handed over $3,500 as a down payment. Detroit's race relations had been deteriorating ever since the Great War, when Southern blacks had begun flooding into the city. But in the summer of 1925, white supremacy had flared to frightening new levels. The black newspaper, the Detroit Independent, reported repeated police assaults on Negroes. Fifty-five blacks had been shot by policemen in the first half of the year alone. A few of them had been executed. There was no other word for it, the way the Johnson brothers had been executed by Arkansas lawmen. For more than a year, patrolman Proctor Pruitt had harbored a grudge against a colored man, Steve Tompkins. One August evening in 1925, Pruitt's commanding officer asked him to deliver a summons to the Tompkins' home in Black Bottom. Mrs. Tompkins politely invited the officer inside. Pruitt walked up to her husband, drew his service revolver, and fired a single shot into Tompkins' left temple. Pruitt had fired in self-defense, the police department claimed. Whether Pruitt was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, no one knew. But there was no doubt that the police department was thick with Klansmen. The KKK had started recruiting in Detroit in 1921, and since then, their poison had seeped into almost every corner of the city. In private, Klan leaders claimed that there were more members in Detroit than in any other place in the country. When ill health forced Detroit's mayor to resign in 1924, the KKK ran one of its own in the special election, called to fill his seat. Only a rigged ballot count kept the Klansmen from victory. The regular election was set for November 1925, and the Klan was determined not to be defeated again. 
All summer long, the Invisible Order organized, building its campaign, spreading its message. And one spectacular night in July 1925, it displayed its power. That evening, 10,000 white-robed knights gathered in a field on Detroit's west side, their rally brilliantly illuminated by the blinding light of a burning cross. Neighborhood violence, though, cut closest to the bone. Five times that summer, crowds of whites attacked blacks who had bought homes in all white areas. One assault, in particular, haunted Ossian. Dr. Alexander Turner was one of the foremost colored doctors in Detroit, a widely respected figure who moved easily between the burgeoning black ghetto and the white world. The highly skilled chief of surgery at the colored hospital, Dunbar Memorial, Turner also held appointments at two major white hospitals, both of which barred most black doctors. But none of it meant a thing in June, when the doctor moved into a beautiful home on Spokane Avenue in an all-white area of Detroit's west side. He had been inside only five hours when a white mob attacked, smashing windows, ripping the phone line, tearing tiles off the roof. Amid the terror, a small group of white men had arrived, claiming to be representatives from the office of Mayor Johnny Smith, an ally of the black community. When the doctor opened the door, 30 or 40 members of the mob rushed in to ransack the place. Turner barely escaped, cowering on the floor of his Lincoln sedan as the chauffeur inched the car through the snarling, screaming hecklers. That night, shocked and humiliated, Turner signed the deed for the house over to the Neighborhood Improvement Society that had whipped the crowd into its frenzy. Ashen had spent an anguished summer Sunday in a colleague's office listening to Turner tell in minute detail the story of what had happened. Afterward, he couldn't keep the ugly scene from preying on his mind. So he sought out the assurances of friends and acquaintances, who invariably cited Turner's failures. The whites were nothing but bullies, Ashen's colleague Carter lectured him. They had meant to intimidate Turner, not kill him. The doctor should have confronted them. He could have made them back down. He had been a damn coward. Others insisted that, had they been in Turner's spot, they wouldn't have retreated. Relaxing in the Dunbar staff room one day, Ashen heard one of the hospital trustees swear, I made up my mind what I would do if a mob comes to drive me out of my home. I have a revolver and a shotgun. I have a rifle. I'm not going to attack anyone that does not attack me. But the first individual that comes over to tear up my home, he'll pay with his life. Gladys also refused to be intimidated. She understood the risks, she said. She'd heard her cousin's terrifying stories of living through the Chicago riot of 1919, when rampaging whites had murdered 23 Negroes. But hearing stories wasn't the same as seeing the mob take control of the streets or hearing a colored boy's screams. Gladys was a northern girl. She hadn't lived with the daily humiliation of Jim Crow, and she'd never actually confronted the fury of white hatred. She'd grown up in a white neighborhood, attended white schools, spent her evenings at the Grand White Theaters, where her stepfather, a musician, performed. In fact, she was almost white herself. Her mother's father was a white man. And Gladys had such light, almost olive skin, she just might have been able to pass, had she been so inclined. There was simply no way she could understand the dangers that might await her on Garland. Not the way Ashen understood them but she wasn't going to be persuaded that the risks were too great. When they talked about the bungalow, Ashen could hear the steeliness creeping into Gladys's voice. You work in the ghetto, she told him, but we don't need to live there. We have a perfect right to live anywhere we please. Such brave talk stiffened Ashen's resolve. He couldn't stand the thought of his colleagues calling him a coward behind his back and he desperately wanted to please Gladys, to give her all she wanted, all she deserved. He had to be strong, to prove to himself that he wasn't afraid of a handful of bitter memories and a summer of white hooliganism. Well, 
We have decided we are not going to run, he said to an acquaintance in midsummer. We're not going to look for any trouble, but we're going to be prepared to protect ourselves if trouble arises. Though Mrs. Smith had agreed to vacate the bungalow by the 1st of August, Ashen delayed taking possession until September 8th, the day after Labor Day. The timing was important. With summer vacation over and school back in session, there was less of a chance his white neighbors would be out on the street when he and Gladys arrived. The sweets would do their best to stay off the streets as well, better not to be seen too often. Even visiting the local stores would be dangerous, so Ashen had Gladys buy enough food to last a week. He asked his in-laws to keep the baby Iva for a while. It wouldn't do to have her underfoot, and he couldn't stand the thought of putting her in danger. No matter how hard he tried, though, Asha knew he couldn't guarantee his family's safety. He had to be prepared for whites to attack. It was suicidal not to be ready for the worst. A friend asked the police department to provide the suites with protection during the first few days in the neighborhood. That was a comfort. But the police couldn't be trusted to put themselves between a Negro and a crowd of angry whites. If the mob should come, there was only one way to keep them at bay. Ashen would have to do it himself. He understood what it would mean to defend his home. Force was the only thing that a mob respected. Back in college, Ashen had been trained to handle a gun. He had a pistol, a thirty-eight Smith & Wesson, a patient had given him a few years back in lieu of payment. But he had to be willing to use it to point it into a crowd of whites and pull the trigger. If he wanted to save his home, Dr. Sweet had to be willing to kill. He knew that. It was just a fact. What's more, he had to ask others to do the same. He couldn't possibly defend the house alone. While he was on the front porch, facing Garland, whites could be battering down the side door, leading out to Charlevoix. Ashen's brother, Otis, immediately agreed to join him in the house the first few nights, as did his younger brother, Henry, who, by a stroke of luck, was spending the summer in Detroit before heading back to college. Ashen's colleague, Edward Carter, also promised to be there, as did Ashen's friend and fellow Howard alumnus, lawyer Julian Perry, and an old school chum, William Davis, a battle-hardened veteran of the Great War, who now worked as a federal narcotics officer. Henry also lined up another veteran, his cousin and college classmate, John Ladding, who had been his roommate that summer. Ashen was gratified and a bit thrilled by the response. He wasn't the sort of man who built strong friendships. Yet, in his time of need, he could draw around him six of the race's most promising young men all of them pledged to face down the mob that the best of the older generation had fled in fear. The suite's tiny caravan came rumbling down Garland Avenue shortly after ten o'clock in the morning on September 8, 1925. Ashen, Gladys, and Davis took the lead, sitting in the back of their Buick trying to hide their nervousness while their chauffeur, Joe Mack, drew up to the curb. Having a driver was a silly indulgence. The suite's Buick wasn't exactly a limousine, and family finances were tight enough without having to pay someone five dollars a day to do something that Ashen and Gladys were perfectly capable of doing for themselves. But Ashen loved the touch of ostentation Mack provided the stairs he drew from the sidewalks as the car glided by. Today, he was also glad to have another man around. Otis, Henry, Ladding, and Norris Murray, a hired handyman, were right behind, riding in the moving truck. As the day unfolded, the sweets might need every hand they could get. Garland was quiet when they arrived. A few housewives stood on the porches, their faces hardened, silently watching the Negroes clamber down from the trucks. But most of the neighborhood men had long since headed off to the factories, and the children, crisp and clean in their new clothes, had been bundled off to the first day of school. Still, Ashen hurried his friends to finish the move as quickly as they could. 
they hustled to unload the suite's few possessions, a bedroom set, a couple of mattresses, a few chairs, some trunks and bags, along with two special bundles, a makeshift package of gunny sack, within which Ashen had hidden a shotgun, two rifles, and six pistols, and a bulging brown satchel weighed down by four hundred rounds of ammunition. The sweets hadn't been in the bungalow an hour when someone rapped on the door. A police officer, an Inspector McPherson, was standing in the shade of the porch. He was short and stocky the way a cop was supposed to look, with a shock of thick white hair and a scar running the length of his face. The department had received the doctor's request for protection, McPherson explained, and was pleased to comply. The inspector had four men on the job already, in fact, but had ordered them to stay out of sight so they wouldn't draw a crowd. McPherson didn't expect any trouble, though. Ashen simply had to be a gentleman, and everything would be all right. Ashen could have taken offense. The last thing he needed was to be lectured on courtesy. But he was so desperate for any reassurance, he simply shook the inspector's hand and thanked him for the help. He never mentioned the arsenal hidden in the linen closet in the upstairs hall. All day long, the sweets kept waiting for trouble to start. Glancing out the front window, Gladys noticed women shuttling from house to house on the other side of Garland, staring hard at the bungalow as they went. As children walked home from school at three o'clock, Ashen heard the fractured voices of teenage boys shouting nigger, their friends' laughter ringing behind them. But the moments passed, and the excitement of being in a new house pushed the sweet's anxieties into the background. Joe Mack and the handyman Murray puttered around the house, cleaning floors, moving boxes and trunks. In mid-afternoon, Dr. Carter stopped by briefly. All good cheer, a set of china he had bought as a housewarming present cradled in his arms. Gladys's dear friend, Edna Butler, maid of honor at her wedding two and a half years earlier, and another friend, Serena Rochelle, arrived a short time later. Butler was a seamstress, Rochelle an interior decorator. Gladys happily pulled them into the living room, where they sat on the floor talking about curtains, furniture, and paint colors, losing themselves in the fun of planning Gladys's new home. Always the proper hostess, Gladys insisted that everyone, Butler and Rochelle, her two brothers-in-law, Davis, Ladding, even Mac, the chauffeur, and Murray, the handyman, stay for dinner. They ate earlier than was the sweet's habit, so Butler, Rochelle, Mac, and Murray could leave for home before darkness fell. But somehow, they lost track of time. When they finished supper around eight o'clock, the sun had set. The terror was about to begin. Everyone understood that danger skyrocketed as soon as darkness descended. The police knew it. As the sun set, the inspector had brought his men, a dozen or more, out of hiding, and put them on the corner of Garland and Charlevoix, in plain view of the neighbors. Yet, at supper's end, Ashen looked out of the living room window and saw the crowd of white people gathered on Garland. He couldn't tell how many were out there, but it was a huge number. He could see that. The cops weren't allowing anyone onto the sidewalk directly in front of the bungalow. So the whites, a hundred, maybe two hundred men, women, and children too, gathered in front of the houses across the street and in the schoolyard on the other side of the intersection. They were just milling around, that's all, standing and talking, sauntering slowly around. But that's the way it would start. Asha knew, quietly and peacefully. That was always the way a nightmare began. Gladys's friends couldn't go out there now, nor could Mac and Murray. A Negro stepping out onto the porch, walking down the sidewalk past the police to the streetcar stop at Charlevoix. That would be the spark right there. There'd be a lynching, here on Garland, under the amber glow of the streetlight. They'd have to stay, all of them, stay inside and pray. Ashen tried to calculate their chances. He had Otis and Henry, Davis and Ladding. Counting himself, 
that made five men prepare to open fire, should it come to that. Mac and Murray were trapped, too. They might lend a hand. But Oshin was also down two men. Julian Perry had never shown up, and Edward Carter hadn't returned, as he had said he would. Oshin needed them both, now. But they didn't come. Half an hour slipped by, with Oshin and the others sitting in the darkness, waiting. Finally, the telephone rang, a sudden jangling noise that must have seemed like an explosion within the stillness of the house. It was Carter, wanting to know how the situation looked. Bad. Very bad, Oshin said. Carter needed to come out right away. There was a moment of silence. I could come out, Carter finally said, but perhaps I would be better able to help on the outside. Ashen couldn't believe what he was hearing. Carter had told him to buy this house. He'd assured him that he'd be safe, that if worse came to worse, he could face down the mob. Be brave, Carter had said. Coward. 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 If you can't come, Ashen snapped, you can't do anything. Then he slammed down the receiver. They would have to do their best. Ashen brought the men upstairs, Mac and Murray too, threw open the linen closet, and distributed the guns. Standing in the narrow hall, they settled on a plan. They'd establish a watch, sitting at the upstairs window, lights out, weapons drawn, scanning the street below. That way, they'd be ready when the crowd turned on them. Evening turned to night. Hour after hour they waited, watching the people come and go, staring at the men who passed in and out of the corner market, which never seemed to close. Some of them smoked to calm their nerves, stubbing out their cigars on the hardwood floors that Gladys had planned to cover with tasteful rugs. Once, just before midnight, a group of men darted out between the two houses on the other side of Garland and threw a few stones at the bungalow. Ashen and his friends stiffened, thinking the moment had come, but the stones bounced harmlessly off the roof. The whites faded into the darkness, and stillness returned. Fatigue gradually set in. While others kept watch, Ashen rested for a while in the small bedroom on the north side of the house. Davis stretched out on a mattress they laid in the living room. But even then, they didn't let down their guard. Someone hit a handgun under a radiator in the living room in case an intruder somehow managed to get through the defenses. The woman catnapped on the lone bed during Gladys's first night in the bedroom she dreamed of sharing with her husband. No one really slept. Every noise from the street, every creaking floorboard, every unexpected sound in an unfamiliar house made them jump. So scared she couldn't lie still, Gladys silently slipped out of bed around four o'clock and wandered through the silent house. She glanced out the window to the street below. Except for the policeman still standing on the corner, it was empty. The crowd gone at last. The sweets and their friends began September 9th exhausted but unscathed. It was a brilliantly sunny summer morning without even a hint of autumn about it. After a hurried breakfast, Gladys's friends, Murray the handyman, Otis, and Davis left to start their days. Henry and Ladding agreed to keep watch while Joe Mack took Ashen and Gladys on a round of errands. It was wonderful to be out, doing ordinary things, enjoying each other's company. At Lieberman's furniture store, the suites bought a dining room set and several chairs for the living room, all in Mission Oak, the perfect complement to the bungalow's arts and crafts style, and two bedroom sets for the boarders' rooms for a grand total of $1,200. From there, Mac drove them over to Gladys's parents so they could spend some time with Iva. Gladys stayed to do some shopping for the night's dinner while Ashen headed down to his office in Black Bottom to put in an afternoon's work. As hard as he tried, though, 
Ashen couldn't stop thinking about the night ahead. Perry and Carter were lost to the cause. Otis and Davis were sure to return, but everyone was going to be so tired he wasn't sure they could handle the pressure once more. Ashen was already feeling the panic creeping back, and he wasn't even home yet. He was still turning the situation over and over in his mind when the telephone call came. As a part of his practice, Ashen conducted medical exams for the black-owned Liberty Life Insurance Company. When Ashen bought the bungalow, he had one of the company's agents, Hewitt Watson, write up a $10,000 policy on the property. An error had been made, something to do with Ashen's birthday, and the home office in Chicago had sent the policy back. Watson was calling to see if he could stop by the doctor's office to make the necessary corrections. Ashen barely knew the man, but he couldn't help himself. He poured out his troubles, pleading with Watson to come out to the house that evening and bring some friends with him. Maybe the insurance man was moved by Ashen's obvious distress. Maybe he thought of his own neighborhood, where he was the only colored man. Whatever his reasoning, Watson promised to help. They agreed to meet at three o'clock, after the insurance man had some time to talk to his colleagues. Right on time, Watson drove up to Ashen's office in his dilapidated Ford. With him were two fellow insurance agents, Leonard Morse and Charles Washington. Ashen had a nodding acquaintance with Washington, a fellow Howard alumnus with a wiry build and somnolent eyes. Morse was a stranger, tall, broad-shouldered and handsome, dressed in a mismatched suit jacket and pants, he spoke in the salesman's rapid-fire patter, his voice grating, his grammar hopelessly mangled. The trio had discussed Sweet's dilemma, Watson said, and they all agreed to join the defense that night. Ashen probably should have been concerned that three men he barely knew were volunteering to take up arms on his behalf, but in his desperation, the thought never crossed his mind. The doctor headed home around four o'clock, sitting silently in the Buick while Joe Mack wove his way eastward from St. Alban to Garland. The traffic was heavy. Downtown businessmen were already beginning their commute to the far reaches of the city. Factory workers were packed into the streetcars, their faces darkened with the day's dirt, their shirts streaked with sweat. The streets that Ashen drove through bore an unmistakable sense of decay. Aged houses set forlornly along the curbside, sagging in the sun, decrepit and poorly maintained. Mac had been driving twenty, maybe twenty-five minutes before he swung the car onto Garland and headed up the long blocks to Charlevoix. Ashen could still hear the rumble of cars and the clang of the streetcar as the chauffeur approached the corner where the bungalow stood. But Garland was almost deserted. A handful of cars were parked along the curb. A few men and women were sitting on their porches. A few kids played listlessly on their lawns. As the Buick reached Charlevoix, Ashen noted the two police officers standing on the corner, just as they had been when he and Gladys had left that morning. Mac pulled the car around the corner, down the alley, and into the garage, away from the sun and the neighbor's view. Inside the bungalow, Ashen found Gladys standing by the sink, the makings of dinner spread on the counter around her. Something was wrong. Ashen could see it in her face. Before he even had a chance to ask, she blurted out that Edna Butler had just phoned. Riding the streetcar home that morning, Butler had overheard the conductor ask a white woman about the previous night's disturbance on Garland. Some niggers have moved in, and we're going to get rid of them, the white woman had said. They stayed there last night, but they'll be put out tonight. The information staggered Ashen. He knew Garland was empty. He'd just seen it himself. But it didn't matter. The house had to be made secure. He had to protect his family from what he knew was possible. Since the shades had been drawn all day, the house was almost completely in shadows. But the foyer was brightly lit, and the front door wide open. When Ashen rushed to close it, he found Henry and John Ladding sitting on the front porch swing, smoking cigars, 
the newspapers spread in front of them. Henry had his own story to tell, just as terrifying as Gladys's had been. Earlier in the day, one of the patrolmen had come by with a warning. The neighborhood toughs had met in the corner market last night to plan their attack. The crowd is coming back tonight double force, the policeman had said. You'd better be on your guard. Henry, proud and determined, had refused to be intimidated. Just a while ago, in fact, he'd walked straight into the store himself to buy some cigars. Now he and Ladding were just going to sit and read a while. Ashen wouldn't stand for it. Turn to your own business and don't bother anyone, he told Henry and Ladding. Don't be walking out on the porch so that people would think you're looking for trouble. They were to get out of sight immediately, go into the kitchen, and give Gladys a hand with dinner. Ashen followed them inside, then bolted the front door shut. His heart was pounding, his pulse racing. Five o'clock. He had a few hours of daylight left. A few hours before... Ashen turned to Mac. Go down to Black Bottom and get Norris Murray, he said. Tell him I'll pay him five dollars if he'll come out to the house tonight. It was a gamble to send the chauffeur away, to reduce their numbers by one. The mob might not wait for nightfall. But Ashen had to take the risk. He had to have more people alongside him. Max slipped out the back door and was gone. Suddenly, he was alone. Ashen could hear Gladys and Henry chatting in the kitchen. But he was alone. He walked into the dining room, took a seat at the card table they were using for their meals, and waited. In some ways, Henry was a better match for Gladys than Ashen. They were about the same age. She was just twenty-three, he twenty-one. And they both had a charm that Ashen simply could never claim. Although he sometimes imagined himself a gregarious man, others found him a bit too aloof, a trifle distant. He attempted to be open and friendly, but it seemed he could never remember people's names correctly. Some said he was formal. Others used the word arrogant. Ashen seemed to expect deference. He was quick to point out the shortcomings of others. He was prone to lecture, even casual acquaintances. Dr. Sweet demanded people's respect, but he didn't easily win their love. Gladys certainly had some of Ashen's forcefulness. Deep down, she was stronger, tougher, and more confident than he was. But she was better able to blunt her sharp edges. Next to her husband, she seemed slight, a wisp of a woman, with a long, thin face that lit up when she smiled her toothy grin. She wasn't beautiful, at least in a conventional way, but her carefully honed social graces drew people to her. Gladys could chat with acquaintances about books and theater. She knew how to entertain gracefully. Although she was shy, she made friends easily. To all appearances, she was the dutiful wife, standing demurely behind her husband, following his lead. In private, though, she exercised a powerful influence over her family. Ashen considered her his prize, and he desperately wanted to please her. Gladys, in turn, expected to be her husband's confidant and partner. Not once had she considered staying away from the bungalow the first few nights, however great the risks, she would share them with Ashen. For his part, Henry worshipped Ashen. Nine years younger than his brother, he was only five when Ashen left home, too young to truly remember sharing their parents' house, young enough to grow up hearing of his eldest brother's triumphs. As soon as he could, he set out to follow the path Ashen had set for him. At Wilberforce University, Ashen's alma mater, he began to train for the life of a professional man, having his hair cut like Ashen's, growing a mustache, even duplicating his brother's glasses. The resemblance was so great that the two could have been mistaken for twins. If Henry only had the fullness, 
the maturity that so clearly marked Ossian as his senior. But Henry still had the boyish playfulness of a little brother, the exuberance that led him to join every campus club he could, the naivete that made him take a policeman's warning lightly. Ossian knew better. Sitting in the heat of the dining room, listening to the idle chatter and the clatter of pots, he knew that they were all in great danger. Tonight, the mob was going to have direction. Someone was going to prod them into action, tell them what to do and when to do it. When that moment came, the patrolmen weren't going to be able to stop them, even if they had the courage to try. Only Ossian, his friends, and a trio of men he barely knew were going to prevent the destruction of his home, his life. The day was melting away, nightfall creeping closer. Time was running out, and Ossian was alone, as he felt he always had been. Then, relief arrived in a rush. The back door slammed, and Mac walked in with Norris Murray. A short time later, Around six o'clock, two of the insurance men, Washington and Watson, pulled into the garage. Leonard Morse wasn't with them. He hadn't been at the pickup spot, so they'd headed over without him. But a few minutes later, Morse surprised them all by sauntering into the house on his own. He'd been delayed by an appointment, he said. So he caught the streetcar out to Garland. It was almost too good to be true. There was still an hour of sun left in the sky. The mob must not have taken over the streets if Morse could hop off the streetcar without any trouble. Only Otis and Davis were missing. But Otis wouldn't let his brother down. Ashen was absolutely sure of that. It was just like little Doc to be late. Ashen tried to be businesslike, walking the three insurance men through the house showing them the upstairs closet where the guns were hidden and the various places established as defensive positions the night before. But he could see they were jumpy. They needed some distraction, a bit of entertainment. Dinner wasn't ready, though the aroma of baked ham and sweet potatoes was filling the downstairs. So he suggested they play a few hands of whist while Gladys, Henry, and Ladding finished cooking. Morse, Mac, and Washington drew chairs up to the dining room table, while Watson stayed in the living room trying to read a magazine by the slant of light the drawn shade allowed into the room. Everyone was on edge. Ashen kept getting up from the table and wandering around the house, checking to be sure that the doors were locked, walking to the upstairs closet where the guns were stored. After a while, Mac left the game, saying he wanted to take a bath upstairs before dinner. Murray set in for a few hands. Then he, too, headed up the stairs to check in on Mac, his only friend in the house. The clock inched toward eight. Suddenly, something slammed against the roof of the house. Henry dashed from the kitchen to the living room windows. My God, he shouted. Look at the people! Ashen rushed to the leaded glass windows that overlooked Charlevoix. Everything looked just as it had the night before. The cops were out on the corner, keeping the sidewalk in front of the bungalow clear. And behind them, in front of the opposing houses and around the schoolyard, half-masked in the dusk, were hundreds of white people. The same white people who'd been out on the street the previous evening. The same, Ashen knew, yet frighteningly different. Somewhere out there, standing among the women and children, lounging on the porches, lurking in the alleys, were the men who would incite the crowd to violence. All the colored men were up and moving now, though no one had any particular direction in mind. Ashen ran to the side door that led onto Charlevoix for one last check of the lock. He heard someone, in the confusion he couldn't say precisely who, saying, Go around to the front. We're going to the back and raise some hell. He spun to the kitchen behind him, desperate to see if Gladys was safe. She was standing over a bowl of cake batter, the night's dessert, 
the ham set in a pan on the stovetop, ready for carving. Brushing past her, he tested the back door lock, then pounded up the stairs to the hallway and the guns. Henry, Latting, Mac, Murray, and the insurance men were all upstairs before him, ducking in and out of bedrooms. Most of them had already grabbed weapons. Ashen opened the closet door, but the hallway was so dim that the dark metal of the guns was indistinguishable in the shadows. Groping around the upper shelf, he finally pulled out a pistol, then rummaged through the satchel for a fistful of ammunition. Only when he tried to pick up the appropriate shells did Ashen, a man so habitually in control of his emotions, realize how badly his hands were shaking. Hoping to camouflage his panic and quiet his unsteady nerves, he shoved the remaining bullets into his pocket and slipped into the front bedroom. Rather than resume the watch, he took a seat on the bed, slid off his shoes so as not to scuff the comforter, and lay down in the darkness, the pistol at his side. For the longest time, ten, fifteen, twenty minutes, he didn't move, the sound of his breathing slowly soothing him. Gladys silently entered the room, their room, and for a few moments the two of them talked, their voices hushed. But for the most part, he was alone, inside himself. Occasionally, he stole a glance at the street below, peering between the drawn shade and the window sill to see a considerable crowd of white people standing on the other side of Garland. In the stillness of the darkened room, they were just a distant hum of voices. Ashen could feel himself gradually regaining control. Then suddenly, the window above him shattered. A rock thudded to the floor near the bed, while shards of glass skittered across the room. Almost simultaneously, Ashen heard a voice from the other room shout, There's someone coming! A taxi had pulled up to the curb in front of the house, that's your brother, someone else yelled. Ashen's first thought was of Gladys. The attack was starting. She was in danger. Rushing toward the stairs, he elbowed his way through the pandemonium in the hallway. The men were racing every which way, trying to take up the positions they'd staked out. He thought he saw Henry, Winchester in hand, heading for the front bedroom. There was a quick rush of fresh air. Someone had opened the door at the back of the hall and gone out to the airing porch that overlooked the yard. Ashen thundered down the stairs. At the foot of the stairs, he found Gladys, who had been drawn there by the sound of breaking glass. Someone was pounding on the front door. Otis. The door was locked. Otis was trapped outside. Ashen raced through the living room, pulled open the French door that led into the vestibule, unbolted the front door, and threw it open. And there it was, the scene he dreaded all his life, the moment he stood facing a sea of white faces made grotesque by unreasoned, unrestrained hate for his race, for his people, for him. Garland was a swirl of light and noise and motion, a blur of bodies moving this way and that, white shirts and summer dresses made stark by a background of darkened houses, the pale skin of people eerie under the street lights. Otis and William Davis were standing right in front of Ashen on the porch, terror-struck. The people on the other side of the street were screaming, Here's niggers! There they go! Get them! Get them! Stones were raining down from across the street, smashing into the lawn, crashing onto the painted wooden floor of the porch, and skittering under the swing where Henry and Ladding had been sitting a few hours before. As soon as Otis and Davis stumbled inside, Ashen slammed the door behind them. Otis immediately ran to the phone, which sat in the alcove at the bottom of the stairs, so he could call a friend for help. Senseless with fear. Ashen stood alongside Gladys and Davis in the dining room as more rocks slammed off the roof and walls. What shall I do? He asked over and over again. What shall I do? Don't do anything, Davis replied. 
Just take your time and give the police officers a chance. But as he spoke, Davis picked up a rifle that had been lying in the living room and cradled it in his arms. A few minutes passed. Another second-story window shattered. The house was filled with the sound of splintering glass hitting the floor upstairs. Then came the deafening roar of gunshots from the bedrooms above. A moment's pause, and another volley, as fierce as the first. Ashen stood stunned, deafened by the report of the guns ringing off the bare walls, the acrid smell of gunpowder beginning to drift down the stairs. Eric Holberg was almost done shaving when the landlady's little boy burst in, breathless with excitement. Eric, come on out, he said. Some guys throwing, small kids throwing bricks and stones. Stoning the colored's house. Holberg had to see that. Before the boy could say another word, he bolted down the stairs and onto the porch of his flat, almost straight across from the bungalow. Some of the other renters were out there already. Mr. and Mrs. Dove and their baby, a few others he didn't know. Holberg started down the steps to the lawn where the crowd was thicker. Then the shooting started. A single, ferocious blast from across the street. That was gunfire. The coloreds were firing into the street. Up on the porch, Mrs. Dove was yelling hysterically, her husband scooping up his suddenly squalling baby and scrambling for the door. Some of the folks on the lawn were looking wildly about, as if they couldn't tell where the noise had come from. Others were ducking low, falling to their knees, racing for cover. Hoberg didn't even flinch. He just kept going, down off the porch and into the crowd. Why he walked up to the man with the pipe? Briner the foreman who lived down the street. He couldn't say. Holberg just wanted to find out what was happening, to do a little commiserating, a touch of socializing. Without a thought, he pulled a cigarette out of his pocket. Briner said something about the Negro shooting. It is awful they should do that. That's what he said, barely enough to fill the silence before the colored men opened fire again, another vicious volley just like the first. Briner screamed, a scream of shock and searing pain as a bullet ripped into his lower back, clipped off the pelvic bone, and exploded out his belly. For a split second, Hoberg simply stared as Briner bit down hard on his pipe as if he were trying to suppress another cry the way a man should. Then Hoberg felt the burn in his own leg just above the knee when he reached down to touch it he felt blood soaking through his pants. His instincts told him to run. Holberg stumbled back from the lawn, down the narrow passageway between his house and the one to the north, toward the safety of the alley. But the pain was too great. Before he could reach the rear of the house, his legs buckled, and he collapsed in a heap onto the dark, cooling cement. Inspector Norton shook-necked, couldn't believe it. One second, he was chatting with his brother-in-law, Otto Limhagen, and Lieutenant Schellenberger, standing on the corner in front of the schoolhouse, shooting the breeze, not paying any attention at all to what was going on in front of the Negro's house. The next thing he knew, guns were blazing from the upstairs windows. The shock of it almost took him off his feet. Instantly, Shipneck knew that this was big trouble. The department had a dozen patrolmen out here, but if the situation exploded, if the Negroes kept shooting, if the whites charged the house, twelve cops weren't going to be able to handle it. Someone was going to get hurt. One of his own men, maybe. Call for reserves, he yelled to the lieutenant. Then Shookneck started across the intersection to the bungalow. It was hard going. The inspector was a bear of a man. The brass buttons on his uniform pulled and strained across his stomach, and he lumbered more than ran. To make matters worse, he had to force his way through the melee at the intersection, people moving in every direction, pushing and shoving, shouting, cursing, calling for spouses or children. Pandemonium. That's what it was. By the time he reached the doctor's front porch, Shookneck was already out of breath, but his adrenaline was pumping. 
and his temper was flaring. The house was pitch dark. If the Negroes hadn't started shooting, it would have been easy enough to imagine that there was no one inside at all. Shookneck punched the doorbell. Ashen was so distraught, so scared, so dazed, he didn't know what to do. He heard Davis screaming at him. For Christ's sake, tell them to cut that damn shooting out there. And he tried to do as he was told, shouting up the stairs. Keep quiet up there. When the doorbell rang, Ashen reacted as if a guest had arrived. He stepped to the door, Davis right behind him, and called out, who is it? The police, a voice replied. Asha knew about Alexander Turner's mistake, opening his door to men who claimed to be city officials. Still, he didn't hesitate. A policeman, red-faced with rage, stepped into the vestibule. He was an older man, considerably overweight and panting for air. Jesus Christ, he demanded. What in hell are you fellows shooting about? Why, they're ruining my property, Ashen said, his first rational sentence since the shooting began. What have they done? I've been right here all along. I haven't seen anyone throw anything, and I haven't seen no disorder. I don't know why you men are shooting. Ashen was stunned. Hadn't the officer seen? Where was Inspector McPherson? When he'd come by yesterday, he said he would protect the house. Couldn't he speak to McPherson? Doctor, the cop interrupted. I was in charge last night, and I am also in charge tonight. We have got men around your house. We got them in the alley. We got them on the side, and we got them on the front. Ashen didn't argue. He didn't say that the police out front hadn't lifted a finger to protect his house and his family from the mob, that they'd been left there to face the terror alone. There'll be no more shooting, he promised. That was enough. Nodding his satisfaction, the policeman walked out of the house. Leon Briner lay at the foot of the steps leading up to the dove's porch, a widening pool of blood seeping onto the brown lawn beneath him. A flashlight beam split through the shadows as a couple of cops pushed their way through the knot of people gathered around. More shouts came down from the passageway, where Holberg had collapsed, another man down. Already the crowd on Garland was changing. The terrified were clearing away, racing back to their homes, dashing down the alleys. As fast as they left, newcomers took their place, pulled out of their flats by the noise and excitement. If anything, the mob was growing larger, angrier, more volatile, not fifteen feet from where Briner lay, twenty or thirty men stood facing the bungalow. Some of them were dancing with the jittery energy of prize fighters, trying to build up the courage to rush the doctor's house. All it would take was one of them to stride into the street, to breach the invisible barrier the police had created. Once that happened, they'd all start moving. Not just the gang of twenty or thirty, but all the thugs in hoods and closet clansmen the crowd concealed. As soon as he stepped out of the house, Shookneck could see that the situation was spiraling out of control. Still, it was a blow when one of his patrolmen sprinted up to him with the news. Two men shot. One was wounded, hit in the leg. The other one, over there on the lawn, looked to be dead. Sweet Jesus! The Negroes had murdered somebody, and they'd done it on his goddamn watch. The inspector quickly ran through his options. The Negroes were going to have to be brought downtown and booked. That was a sure thing. But he couldn't bring them out of the house now, not unless he wanted to see them ripped limb from limb. Better to keep the mob at bay until reinforcements arrived. Shookneck barked out a few commands set up a perimeter around the house. No one gets past. We'll take care of the coloreds when we can. It shouldn't have worked. So many people were pouring into the street that the intersection was almost impassable. 
The more the crowd pushed and jostled and jeered, the darker the mood became. Someone spotted three colored men trapped in traffic at Charlevoix and St. Clair Avenue, a block east of the bungalow. There go some niggas now, came the cries. Lynch them! Kill them! A gang of white men surged toward the car, the quickest of them leaping onto the running board and swinging wildly at the trio inside. As the others closed in, the driver slammed his foot on the gas and swung into oncoming traffic, flinging his assailant to the pavement as he sped to safety. When a colored couple drove into the neighborhood a few minutes later, the mob moved more quickly, swarming over the car, smashing its windows, clawing off its cloth top, and pummeling the husband as he sat at the wheel. Only his wife's begging for mercy saved them. For all its fury, though, the mob stayed back from the bungalow. Shooknecks men had established their ragged line around the sweet's house. No one had the guts to test their resolve. The crowd kept growing larger, seeping farther and farther into the neighborhood. But the police perimeter held firm. A half dozen cops standing along the sidewalk, trying to keep their knees from shaking too badly. And they didn't break. Though it seemed much longer, no more than five minutes had passed when the reserve flyer eased its way through the mob with a truckload of reinforcements. While the patrolmen scrambled down from the flatbed, Shooknet grabbed hold of their sergeant. Put together a squad and follow me, he said. We're going back in to get the Negroes. Ashen must have known that something was wrong. He had to have heard the furor outside the house, the screams and shouts, the squeal of car tires, the wail of police sirens. But in the darkness of the living room, the terror was dissipating, the paralyzing fear of the previous few minutes loosening its grip. Davis had set down the rifle he'd been holding. Otis had given up trying to phone his friend and was standing beside his brother. Someone was heading downstairs. Maybe Edward Carter had been right. Maybe whites will back down when colored men show they won't be moved. When the doorbell rang again, Ashen stood by and let Gladys answer it. The cops burst in. No conversation. No accusations. They just shoved past Gladys and into the living room. One of them snapped on the lights, the first light in the house all day, and pulled up the shades. Ashen must have been momentarily blinded, stunned by the burst of brilliance and the flash of movement. Gradually, the room came back into focus. There were cops everywhere, waving revolvers, shouting commands, demanding that Ashen, Gladys, Davis, and Otis move into the dining room, wanting to know how many other Negroes were in the house, searching around for the staircase, which was tucked away behind the dining room. So many voices, so much activity. No time to argue. Follow orders. Just do what the policemen say. Boots pounded overhead as the cops moved through the bedrooms, rounding up the others. One by one they appeared. Washington and Mac first, then Henry and Latting, Watson, Morse, and Murray, followed by patrolmen carrying the cache of weapons Ashen had carefully assembled. With every new addition, the dining room grew tighter, smaller, more stifling. The cops patted them all down, searching for more guns. Then they wrenched Ashen's arm to one side, and he felt cold steel snap over his wrist. He was being handcuffed to Davis, the two men bound together like prisoners on the chain gangs that haunted the roads outside his hometown. The inspector was talking now, the fat one who'd come inside a few minutes before. Something about two white men shot, killed, murdered. All of them would have to go downtown to headquarters. It took Ashen a moment to realize what the inspector was saying. He was going to take them outside, out to the mob. In that instant, Ashen became a boy again. Not himself, that other boy, his hands bound, his head bowed, spending his last moments surrounded by his murderers, wailing, 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 as the fire started to crackle. He began to plead. Bring down the shades. 
We're on display for everyone to see. Don't take us out the front. They're waiting out there. The alley. Take us out that way. Please, God, take us out the alley. Mac, the chauffeur, stepped forward. He'd spotted someone he knew standing in the living room, a rail-thin white man dressed in street clothes, his long, narrow face and blonde hair blanched by the bright lights. He had to be a cop. Every white man in the house was a cop. They talked in quick, hushed tones. When the conversation ended, the white man walked over to Ashen. He was a lieutenant with the Black Hand Squad, he said, working for Inspector McPherson, and he was here to see to the Negro's safety. There was a kindness about him that Ashen couldn't have expected. The lieutenant drew the shades again and ordered Ashen's handcuffs removed. The doctor wasn't a threat, he said. Then he sent a patrolman outside to wait for the paddy wagon and send it around back. He'd take the men out first. Gladys would follow when the situation had cooled. It must have been the most terrifying step Ashen had ever taken. The first step out the back door into the yard. Otis, Henry, and the rest moved in a long, single line, patrolmen on either side, the lieutenant in the lead. In the clear night air, the noise on the street was even more intense, more immediate than it had been inside the bungalow. A wooden fence separated Ashen and the others from the crowd on Charlevoix, so no one knew they were there, moving silently across the grass, that Gladys had hoped to turn into a garden. The plainclothesman led them through the garage, where Ashen's Buick and the insurance men's old Ford were nestled, and into the alley. Face to face with the mob. The paddy wagon had been backed far enough into the alley so that its back doors were within a few feet of the suite's garage. That left the wagon's hood across the sidewalk along Charlevoix. Just to the front of that, along the street, was a wall of frenzied whites, waiting for the moment when the coloreds appeared. A second passed before the mob realized that the suspects were within reach, a heartbeat before the charge began. The lieutenant knew exactly what he was doing. He had his gun raised above his head so that the front row of whites could see it, and he was moving straight toward the mob. If anyone makes a move to crash in, he shouted, I'll shoot to kill. The whites seemed to stop, straining to hear, waiting for someone else to act, too intimidated to move. This was all the time they needed. The patrolman shoved Ashen and the others into the back of the wagon, slammed shut the metal doors, and slapped the side of the trunk to get it moving. Ever so slowly, the driver edged the vehicle forward, testing to see how far he could go before the mob stopped him. A few inches, a foot, closer to the cut in the curb and the crowd in the street. One person, then another, and another stepped back, parting to let him pass. The paddy wagon pulled into the street, away from the bungalow, and into the sweltering summer night. Chapter 2 A No Slavery No More Ashen Sweet sat shoulder to shoulder and knee to knee with his brothers and the other men as the paddy wagon rumbled toward police headquarters. When the patrolman had padlocked the door behind him, Ashen must have been relieved. Although the mob's screams pierced the wagon's steel walls, the crowd couldn't touch him, couldn't drag him down Garland Avenue to the schoolyard, couldn't lynch him from the streetlight that brightened the intersection in front of his new home. In the darkness of the wagon, he was safe. Yet, as the tumult on Garland trailed away, Ashen's momentary confidence collapsed. It was so claustrophobic inside the steel cage that he could barely breathe. The others were straining, too, more than he was, since their hands were still cuffed behind them while his were free. Every time the paddy wagon lurched over a streetcar track or a sewer grate, they all heard the jingling of the bullets Ashen had jammed in his pockets, damning evidence of his intent to do bodily harm. That's what the cops at headquarters would be looking for, something they could use to build a case against Ashen and his compatriots.
to turn them from the mob's intended victims into crazed colored men, criminals, murderers. He would have to make them understand. That's all there was to it. When the police started to question him, he would have to give them a clear and cogent explanation as to why he moved into a neighborhood where he wasn't welcome, why he'd filled the house with guns, and why he'd been prepared to use them. But Ashin didn't have a coherent story to tell. He had the shards of his family's history, the legacy of a half-remembered moment when the world was full of promise, the dreams his mother had sustained during the bitter descent into segregation, the weight of his name, the meaning of which he barely knew. And he had his own memories, trailing backward from Garland Avenue to the Jim Crow South, backward to the dusty streets of his boyhood home, to the tidy kitchen of the house his father built, to the tiny school where the black children learned their lessons, to the riot of trees and tropical plants tumbling down the banks of the Peace River, to the smell of burning flesh wafting across the placid water, filling his imagination with the most grotesque of horrors. Ashen knew his grandfather, Remus Devon, as a wizened old man, bent and bowed. But when Remus was young, he had been the center of a revolution. In those days, Remus and his brothers, George, Harrison, Hubbard, Edmund, Romulus, and Amos, were poor men, their hands thick with calluses from years of driving hoes into the red clay of other men's land. They had no homes of their own. Their landlords supplied the rude log cabins where they raised their families. They had no education. When their children practiced their letters on their slates, their fathers couldn't help them. But it wasn't the desperation of poverty that made the Devons revolutionaries. It was hope. The brothers had been born to bondage. In the early 1800s, most Southern whites were subsistence farmers, tilling their own fields, growing their own food, making their own clothes. Their owner, Alexander Cromarty, was different. A slave owner's son, born and raised on a prosperous plantation in the gently rolling hills of North Carolina, Alexander could have stayed home, waiting to inherit his share of his father's estate. But in the 1820s, young men like Alexander weren't settling for what their parents could give them. A man could better his fortune if only he worked hard and took some chances. And Alexander wasn't afraid to take chances. Packing up his family, he headed to Leon County, Florida, just south of the Georgia border. Among his household goods was a black boy, Edmund Devon, Ash and Sweet's great-grandfather and the father of Remus and his brothers. Since the last years of the 18th century, southern planters had been making themselves rich by selling cotton to the textile mills of industrial England. But these planters had already taken the best cotton land along the eastern seaboard. So ambitious young men like Alexander pushed deeper and deeper into the southern interior in search of new land to cultivate. They found the perfect conditions in the rich red loam that ran through southern Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, and the northern reaches of Florida. Alexander grabbed his share buying 1,300 acres of prime cotton land on the banks of Florida's Lake Iamonia in newly settled Leon County, 15 miles north of the territorial capital of Tallahassee. It was raw land, its red hills thick with forests, its roads rudimentary, its few settlements spartan. Tallahassee is a grotesque place, sniffed the visiting Ralph Waldo Emerson. Rapidly settled by public offices, land speculators, and desperados. Small-time farmers here might work the fields themselves, but major planters needed slaves, as many as they could afford. There were twice as many slaves as whites in Leon County by 1840, three times as many by 1860. Keeping with the tradition of American slavery, bondmen had no rights, no legal or social standing. But Florida's lawmakers went further than other states. Slaves couldn't leave their plantations, even for a walk, 
without the written permission of their owners. They couldn't trade goods among themselves or learn to read or gather for prayer meetings. If they committed crimes, their hands were burned by heated irons, their ears nailed to posts, their backs stripped raw by the lash. Badly outnumbered by their slaves, Leon County planters lived in fear of revolt. Sometimes violence burst to the surface. One evening, a planter dragged a slave into the yard for a flogging. Before the planter could begin, the slave grabbed an axe and split his master's skull. But the ferocity of the law undercut more organized rebellion. So slaves sought other ways out of bondage. Leon County planters were continually searching for escaped slaves who fled to the swamps south of the Cotton Belt, where it was difficult for slave hunters to track them. Fugitives would find refuge in the scattered camps of the Seminoles. A few would strike out for the north, so very far away. Alexander's kinsman, Cornelius Devane, followed him to Leon County in the early 1830s. Shortly after he arrived, a slave couple he owned, loveless and pink, stole his shotgun, gathered up their three children, the youngest, just five months old, and headed into Georgia, there to begin the long, dangerous journey to the Ohio River and freedom. Alexander's young slave, Edmund, may well have dreamed about following their example, but nothing indicates that he ever acted on those hopes. Edmund passed into adulthood working the Cromarty's land, helping to strip the Florida hills of pine, to divide the acreage into fields the slaves filled with row after row of cotton, to make his master and his young wife a comfortable home appropriate to their station. By 1860, Alexander was one of the wealthier planters in Leon County, master of 55 slaves, a southern gentleman through and through. When he came of age, Edmund took a wife, a young slave woman named Gilla, and together they began to build a family. Between 1840 and 1852, the couple had seven sons, beginning with George in 1840 and ending with Amos in 1852. But the tiny, beautiful infants were never completely Edmund and Gilla's children. From the moment they entered the world, the boys became Alexander Cromarty's property another asset on his ledger, another measure of his success. And when they had children of their own, their bondage would be passed on once again, parent to child, generation to generation, forever and ever. Or so Cromarty and his fellow slave owners hoped. As the Devon brothers passed through childhood, though, the institution of slavery was plunged into crisis, during the nation's first half-century, America's political leaders did their best to keep the slavery question out of public debate. In the 1840s and the 1850s, the issue exploded. Edmund and Gilla's fifth and sixth sons, twins, Romulus and Remus, were six years old when Southern slaveholders pushed Congress to open Kansas to slavery, an act that convinced anti-slavery forces to organize a new political party, the Republicans, as a counterweight to the slave power. The twins were eight years old when the advocates and opponents of slavery plunged Kansas into guerrilla warfare, eleven when the United States Supreme Court affirmed the sanctity of slavery with the Dred Scott decision, twelve when the Republicans elected their candidate, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States. The election became the breaking point. In the months leading up to Lincoln's inauguration, the southern states seceded from the Union, and the nation descended into civil war. Alexander Cromarty dutifully sent his firstborn son and namesake to fight for the planter's right to keep human beings in bondage. While young Alexander risked his life, his father did his best to maintain plantation life as it had always been. His rule lasted longer than did most planters. As northern troops pushed farther and farther into the south, thousands of the enslaved fled their masters for the Union lines, there to claim freedom for themselves. Leon County was far from the main lines of battle, so it wasn't until the Confederacy began to crumble in 1864 and early 1865 that the county's slave regime collapsed. Slaves started to talk back to their masters, 
some refused to work as ordered. Many disappeared altogether, fleeing into the woods or slipping quietly away to meet the federal troops, at last making their way toward the Florida state line. The Union Army finally took Tallahassee on May 10, 1865, a full month after Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Word had passed through the plantations that when the slaves heard a gunshot, they were free. The shot came at midday when they were in the fields. They dropped their plows and hoes where they stood, returned to their cabins to dress in their Sunday best, then joined the flood of black men, women, and children on the road to Tallahassee, hurrying, a participant said, to go see the Yankees. Edmund never saw slavery's end. He passed away in 1857, four years before the Civil War began. So Gilla brought her boys into adulthood on her own. When emancipation arrived that day in May, the Devon brothers were young men in their teens and twenties, the perfect age to find their way in a new world of freedom. But freedom had no shape, no substance, in the spring of 1865. Negroes could work for wages, but they had no jobs. They could learn to read and write, but they had no schools. They could leave their former masters and strike out for themselves, but they had no homes, no land of their own. They could plead for government assistance in their time of need, but they had no political power, no vote, no elected representatives to assure their voices would be heard. Across Leon County, Former slaves tried to shape freedom for themselves. The vast majority of freedmen were farmers, and they knew they could provide for their families if only they had a few acres of their own. They dreamed of land, not row upon row of cotton, just enough to cultivate some crops. Freedmen also desperately wanted to school their children. Free people needed to read and write if they were to manage their own affairs. But it was more than that. Everything their masters had denied them, schooling, family, property, freedom of movement, Negroes were now determined to claim for themselves, whatever the consequences. The mistress of a great Leon County plantation ordered a former house slave, her daughter's dear black mammy, not to attend a political rally in Tallahassee, but the freedwoman said she would do as she pleased. The planter's wife was livid. If you disobey me in this matter she said. You and your family must leave the place. By nightfall, the dear black mammy was gone. There is no knowing whether the Devons likewise deserted the Cromarty plantation. It's possible that they stayed with their former master. Gilla might have had some distant memory of her North Carolina childhood, but any connection there had been severed long ago. Edmund was buried in Florida soil, and her boys knew no place other than Leon County. If they did leave the Cromartys, the Devons didn't go far. Like most former slaves in the first days of freedom, they would have moved onto a neighboring plantation, close enough to the Cromartys to be familiar, far enough to be independent. For their part, the masters of Leon County were determined to make sure that the Devons and their fellow freedmen went no further. A few months after Union troops occupied Tallahassee, the federal government returned control of the state to the planters. Immediately, the former slaveholders passed a series of laws, pushing blacks to the very edge of bondage. Freedmen were to sign year-long contracts to work the planters' fields. Those who broke their agreements could be sold into service for a year's time. Those convicted of even minor crimes against a planter's property stealing his cotton or injuring his livestock, were to be whipped and pilloried. Once bound to the planter's land, Negroes were subject to the same casual cruelty their masters had always imposed. But the planters overreached themselves. The federal government hadn't sacrificed the better part of a generation, 360,000 soldiers dead, to assure the former slaveholders continued domination over southern land and labor. Appalled by the planter's audacity, in 1866, the Republican Congress dissolved the southern state governments formed the previous year. 
put the entire region back under military control and launched one of the most extraordinary experiments the nation had ever undertaken. Its purpose is masked by the bland name of Reconstruction. The Republicans who controlled Washington pledged to remake the South root and branch. Congress would amend the Constitution to give freedmen all the rights that white Americans enjoyed, including the right to vote. What's more, Republicans would use the power of the federal government to give the South a glittering new economy where every man, regardless of the color of his skin, could sell his labor in a free and open market. Congress would create opportunity by linking the South, devastated by four years of war, with the vibrant economy of the North. The federal government would encourage industry to build railroads so the southern farms and factories could ship their goods to the cities of the North. Congress would open public schools for southern children, white and black, and it would provide freedmen training in the rudiments of economic exchange, how to negotiate a labor contract, how to work for wages, how to sell crops for a profit, so they could compete for work on a free and fair footing. Knowing that planters would do all they could to resist such extraordinary changes, Congress dispatched thousands of federal agents across the South to implement Reconstruction programs. Most of these soldiers, teachers, and preachers were white, all aflame with the fire of the free market gospel, but a precious few were colored. Many of the latter were men of the cloth, missionaries of the northern black churches, all the major black denominations sent ministers to the South in the late 1860s. But none of them was better suited to the Reconstruction Project than the ministers of the African Methodist Episcopal AME Church. Methodists preached that even the most humble person could be reborn into God's grace if only he or she rejected sin and embraced a life of holiness. Believers experienced rebirth in a moment of ecstasy, triggered by the tumult of the vast camp meetings that preachers mounted. Once in the flock, the saved proved their virtue by following the strictest of moral codes. Methodists did not drink, swear, gamble, fornicate, or fight. They worked hard, paid their debts, dealt honestly with others. They taught their children to read, write, and do sums. Such discipline was the mark of grace. It was also the perfect match for the free market. Religion must necessarily produce industry and frugality, Methodism's founder John Wesley proclaimed, and these cannot but produce riches. In the early days, American Methodists spread the promise of deliverance through circuit riders who traveled the back road seeking converts among the poor and downtrodden, regardless of skin color. But like so many other institutions, the church foundered on the rock of racism. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, white congregants in a number of northern cities tried to segregate the free blacks in their midst. Rather than accept second-class salvation, Negroes walked out of the white churches and established their own denomination. AME preachers maintained the Methodist discipline, but they enveloped it in a powerful racial consciousness. They would battle the evil of slavery, confront every manifestation of discrimination in the North, and prove to the whites, by their thoughts and their deeds, that blacks deserve to be treated as equals. Indeed, they would do the whites one better. They would be more frugal, more hardworking, better educated than their white neighbors. By their accomplishments, they would force whites to acknowledge their equality. It was a heavy burden to bear. If we are lazy and idle, explained the AME's founder, the enemies of freedom pleaded as a cause why we ought not to be free and say we are better in a state of servitude. These AME circuit riders followed the Union troops into the South, determined to proclaim their message of racial uplift to the former slaves. Many freedmen were put off by the condescension and criticism the AME preachers leveled. They flocked instead to the Baptists, who were more willing to accept the freedmen as they were. But a significant minority joined the AME, 
the very sight of the ministers, forceful black men, brooking no opposition, demanding respect, must have been a draw. But the minister's message, the wonder of God's word flowing into the promise of liberation, also riveted many to the church. Many more must have been attracted by the churchmen's temporal promises. The freedmen ought to buy land, the ministers preached. Hard work and self-discipline would give them the means. Young people needed education if they were to seize the opportunities that would be opening up to them. The AME would build them schools. Elder Charles Pierce wound his way through the northern Florida cotton district in the spring of 1866. Bearded in the style of Lincoln, Pierce was a muscular man, physically and spiritually. Born and raised in freedom, almost twenty years an AME minister, Pierce was a lion of the church, a missionary zealot. Everywhere he went, he found the spirit of jubilee, drawing the freedmen to him and his church. Revivals burned long into the night. 116 new members in Tallahassee, 453 in neighboring Gadsden County, another 343 in Jefferson County. It is only necessary for us to name the AME Church to them, and they are willing to cast in their lot with us, and they're still coming by the score, Pierce wrote. We are all looking forward to a glorious future. Religious fervor blended with political organizing. From the start, AME ministers were determined to carve out a role for themselves and their congregations in the Reconstruction government that would eventually replace military rule. 2,500 freedmen jammed the Leon County meeting ground in May 1867 to hear Pierce and other ministers denounce the evils of slavery and campaign for the Republican Party. Planters were stunned by the turnout, but the ministers were simply tapping into the political passions pulsing through black communities. The Devon brothers were swept up in the AME's crusade. Gilla's oldest son, George, joined the ministry in 1867 at the age of 27 and was assigned to the Leon County Mission. Her third son, Hubbard, followed him a few years later. The family had no trouble adjusting to the discipline that racial uplift required. Gilla and her seven sons drew themselves into a tight circle, all settling together on Solomon Sill's plantation, just a few miles from the Cromarties. As sharecroppers, they tilled Sill's fields and earned a third of the crop they grew. It was a smart strategy. By living and working together, they maximized their earnings and set themselves on the road to buying land of their own. Undoubtedly, they sent their older children to the nearby AME schoolhouse, which was tied to George's mission, where two black teachers taught 93 children to read and write. When the federal government created a freedman's bank to encourage savings, the Devons opened accounts. They couldn't have had much money to put on deposit, but a minister's family had to set an example to show the faithful and the prodigal the virtues of hard work, thrift, and sobriety. It was never easy. The brothers were marrying and having children of their own now. Romulus and his wife Lisa had a daughter, Julia, in 1865. The next year, his twin had his first son, Robert. Hubbard had a daughter, Nancy, the year after that. Their growing families needed more food, more space, and more money. Every step was a struggle. In 1867, a drought withered the cotton fields, leaving black families so desperate that only the distribution of government rations staved off a winter of complete deprivation. The next growing season began well, but a midsummer plague of caterpillars destroyed much of the crop and left most blacks poorer than when the year began. Worse, the planters used their power to subvert the freedmen's efforts. Leon County landowners blocked government attempts to settle freedmen on federal land, and they refused to sell even small portions of their plantations to Negroes. Many planters ruthlessly exploited the colored families who rented small plots from them. A few used the slightest pretenses to expel their tenants from the land 
once the crop was close to harvest. The threat of violence was constant. Across the cotton belt, planters organized terrorist cells. The Regulators, the White Cappers, the Ku Klux Klan. Operating under the protection of darkness, the Klan and their fellows targeted anyone who dared to challenge white domination. They forced teachers in colored schools to abandon their posts. They threatened, assaulted, and burned out those few freedmen who managed to acquire land of their own. Mostly, they waged war against the Republican state governments that set Reconstruction's rules. Vigilantes assassinated dozens of Republicans in the late 1860s and early 1870s, as many as 70 in the heavily black county just east of Leon, where the Klan ran rampant. Great as it was... The terror only pushed the AME's leaders toward an even more vigorous defense of black rights. They made progress. In 1868, the Republican Party took control of Florida's state government, installing 19 black state legislators, eight of them AME ministers or prominent laymen, Elder Pierce foremost among them. But the colored delegation was surrounded by a sordid collection of political opportunists, more interested in bringing northern business interests into Florida and fattening their wallets than in breaking the power of white supremacy. Four years later, when the governor told Pierce that he was powerless to prevent further outrages against the freedmen, church leaders led a coup, overturning the Republican Party's established leaders and handing the 1872 gubernatorial nomination to an avowed reformer, Ashen Hart to whom they delivered the black vote in the general election. Elder C.H. Pierce saved this state to the Republican Party, a newspaper man wrote in the election's aftermath. Florida is destined to become the Negro's new Jerusalem. Hart wasn't quite that radical. Tall and broad-shouldered, with a mane of white hair, he had the look of a planter, the unquestioning paternalism of someone to the manor born. He hadn't freed his own slaves until the last days of the Civil War, and he'd only grudgingly supported the freedmen's right to vote. Like his predecessors, Hart was primarily interested in tying the state to northern business. He wanted to see railroad lines brought into the peninsula so he could link his friends, cattlemen who raised great herds on the open range of central Florida, to the slaughterhouses of Chicago. But he understood who had put him in the governor's mansion and a gentleman always pays his debts. When anti-black violence broke out in Columbia County, east of Leon, Hart dispatched a contingent of black troops to the area to restore order. He rammed a civil rights law through the legislature, prohibiting discrimination in most public facilities. He named a Negro to head Florida's public school system and committed his administration to dramatically expanding state funding for education. And he appointed AME officials to dozens of minor political posts, from county superintendent to tax assessor. The Devons got their due. In early 1873, Hart named Edmund and Gillis' third son, Hubbard, Justice of the Peace, Leon County's primary law enforcement official. The governor undoubtedly thought of the appointment as another political payoff, the price of victory. But the Devons saw it as more than that, much more. When Hubbard claimed the position, he took the place of another promising young man, Alexander Cromarty, his former master's elder son. So the revolution had come. Eight years earlier, the Devon brothers had been pieces of property. Now they were men who demanded respect, missionaries of the word, spreading the gospel to their fellow freedmen aspiring farmers, working to earn a share of the American dream. They were still poor, still landless, still struggling to be equal to whites, in fact, as well as in name. But they had come so very far. There was every reason to be hopeful. A few months after Hubbard took office, his younger brother Remus and his wife had their fourth child, Dora. What must have run through Gilla's mind as she cradled her granddaughter in her leathery arms?
This child wouldn't be like her babies, who had been born into a world now dead and gone. This child would have a future all her own. Hope proved to be a very fragile thing. When Ashen Hart suddenly died in March 1874, his 14-month experiment in racial justice collapsed, and the Florida Republican Party slipped back into the hands of opportunists whom the AME had overturned. The church block was broken. Democrats resumed their attack on Negro rule. Landlords threatened black voters with eviction. The Klan renewed its terror against black office holders. Intimidation and fraud peaked during the 1876 presidential and gubernatorial elections, Florida's first since Hart's death. When both the Republicans and Democrats claimed victory in the presidential election, the nation was thrown into a constitutional crisis. Only a Faustian bargain broke the deadlock. The Republican candidate, the ineffectual Rutherford B. Hayes, took the White House, Democrats took control of Florida state government. Hayes promised them that there would be no more federal interference in their affairs. The Democrats, champions of white supremacy, could do as they wanted. Florida's Democrats had no intention of reversing the Republicans' economic policies. In fact, they pushed them harder than ever before. The Democratic legislature handed over huge sections of public land to northern railroad companies, which reciprocated by extending their line south from the Georgia border all the way to the Florida Keys. Florida's economic might had always been centered on the panhandle, but when the tracks linked the peninsula to northern markets, the state's center shifted. Central Florida cattlemen expanded their herds, while farmers planted glorious citrus groves where wild grasses had always grown. Businessmen built lumber and turpentine camps to process the product of the forest they stripped bare. Land speculators platted towns where farmers could sell their goods and workers could spend their wages. Shopkeepers and doctors and lawyers filled the new main streets with their stores and offices. This was the economic opportunity the Republicans had dreamed of bringing to the South. But the Democrats made sure that the New South would be for whites only and set about undoing the racial policies it had taken the Civil War to create. It took them until 1885 to assure the destruction of the Florida Republican Party and another decade to complete their oppression of the colored race. There were, after all, practical problems to overcome. The 14th and 15th Amendments guaranteed Negroes their rights, and it was no simple matter to subvert the Constitution. The Democrats also had to overcome the limits of their imagination. They knew how to be cruel, but they had to create a social system premised on cruelty. This was a task that took some creativity. Some steps were obvious. Black voters had made radical republicanism possible so they had to be stripped of the right to vote. As a start, the Democrats imposed a poll tax in 1887. Voter registration plummeted by 50% the first year the tax was imposed. The Democrats followed that triumph by gradually tightening registration further. By 1895, when the last laws were put into place, it was almost impossible for a Negro to vote in the state of Florida. The next steps were more complicated. The vast majority of whites assumed blacks to be inferior. The trick was to make them act on those beliefs. Democrats began by defending the purity of the white race. Not a straightforward matter in a society where interracial sex had a long history. But legislators, insisting that racial lines could be strictly drawn, imposed a stringent definition of who qualified as colored. A person was legally a Negro if just one of his great-grandparents had been black. Legislators also prohibited any further dilution of the white race. Blacks and whites couldn't have sexual relationships, couldn't marry, couldn't even spend a night in the same bedroom.
With the groundwork laid, the Democrats gradually moved into the public sphere. Florida's whites had already barred blacks from some public places, such as theaters and hotels. But the segregation didn't have the force of law. It was custom, nothing more. The Democrats mandated the separation and extended it to the places where the New South was being created. Florida was one of the first southern states to require blacks to ride in separate railroad cars, and the legislature made it a crime to teach black and white children in the same classroom. As the Democrats made it more and more difficult to be black, whites became more and more determined to assert the power of their race, so they piled prohibition on prohibition. Blacks couldn't be buried in the same cemeteries as whites. They couldn't eat in the same restaurants. They couldn't ride in the front of city streetcars. They couldn't drink from the same drinking fountains. Whites also segregated their workplaces. Blacks could be servants and farm laborers, of course, and they could work in the turpentine and lumber camps where most whites didn't want to go. But whites claimed the vast majority of jobs for themselves. They also demanded privileges that superiority conferred. They expected blacks to step off the sidewalk when a white person approached. They insisted that blacks keep their eyes downcast when they spoke to whites. They demanded that blacks call them sir or ma'am, though they would never dream of reciprocating. They felt free to level any insult, to inflict any injury, without fear of reprisal. Jim Crow taught the great mass of Southern whites to see ordinary places and everyday interactions as sacred, and to protect the sacred by embracing the profane. Remus Devon's daughter, Dora, grew up as the great hopes of Reconstruction collapsed around her family. As soon as he became governor, Ashen Hart's successor removed her uncle Hubbard as justice of the peace. The family circle that the Devons had drawn around themselves began to break. In 1876, the AME bishop ordered Hubbard to leave Leon County and take up a position at a mission to the south. Maybe the bishop was trying to protect him. AME ministers had become a particular target of clan violence. Remus's baby brother Amos just drifted away, and his other brother Edmund left to take a job teaching school in Jefferson County, a small triumph for the AME's promise of uplift. But for the most part, Jim Crow choked off the advancement the preachers had proclaimed. By Dora's seventh birthday, only her father Remus and his twin brother Romulus remained in Leon County. Romulus somehow sustained his family on the few dollars he earned as a whitewasher. Remus kept working the land, as he'd always done, but it was harder and harder to eke out a living. As black political power faded, white landlords were imposing harsher terms on their tenants than they had been able to do during Reconstruction. Each bale of cotton was bringing in less than before, and Remus didn't have a way to increase his production. Dora's older siblings, Robert, Eliza Jane, and Sally, were going to school so Remus didn't have their help in the fields for much of the year. Dora was old enough to work around the house, but too young to spend her days nursing the cotton crop. And she also needed to begin her education soon. Then there were the babies, Maggie and Remus Jr., to feed and clothe. Dora's father could have pulled the children out of school and sent them to the fields, but that would have meant turning his back on his faith in his abilities and in his church's teachings. It would have meant mortgaging his children's futures, just as he had surely mortgaged his own to land that wasn't and never would be his. He finally gave up. Sometime in the 1880s, two decades after he'd been freed from bondage, Remus left Leon County and moved his family south to the central Florida boom town of Orlando. Orlando had been nothing more than a frontier town when the Democrats had assumed control of the state. But when Democrats convinced Florida Southern Railroad to connect it to the northbound lines in 1880, Orlando had become a bustling commercial center.
Remus must have believed that there would be work at the railroad terminal, where the citrus farmers piled their oranges for shipment, or in the sawmills, where the pine trees being stripped from nearby forests were planed. Maybe life would be easier there. It wasn't. If anything, whites were more committed to enforcing Jim Crow in cities and towns than they were in the countryside. Remus did the best he could, settling his family in a small rented home in the black section of town. He tried to find steady work, but he never broke out of the narrow range of jobs to which whites relegated blacks. And after years of struggle, he was discarded. By 1900, he was unemployed. At 52, he was probably too old to find steady work, certainly too old for the back-breaking labor most blacks performed. So he lived on the largesse of his youngest children, now grown to early adulthood. And they, in turn, scraped by on the little that whites were willing to offer them. Remus Jr. worked as a teacher in Orlando's impoverished black school system. Maggie was a washerwoman. It would have been easy enough, under the circumstances, to abandon the AME's promises. It was painfully obvious that blacks couldn't raise themselves up in such a society. But for some reason, Dora couldn't let go of the great expectations that had swirled around her birth. She had heard the message of uplift and improvement week after week at church, and she couldn't set it aside. A handsome young woman, powerfully built, she carried herself with a quiet dignity that would become her hallmark. But behind it lay a fierce determination to recapture the moment when her family's dreams had been on the verge of fulfillment. Dora wasn't driven by a sense of nostalgia. She didn't want to recreate the past. She wanted to revive its hopes and make them real. Dora Devon couldn't have been more than 16 or 17 when she fell in love with Henry Sweet, an ordinary man, typical of the post-war generation. His family had never found the stability the Devons had enjoyed until Jim Crow came. Henry's parents were enslaved in East Texas, the western reaches of the Cotton Kingdom. Sometime before the Civil War, they'd been moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a desperate place to spend the war. Union forces slowly choked off the Alabama interior. By 1864, Tuscaloosa was suffering from severe food shortages, and even the most devout rebels dreamed of the day when the fighting would end. Family lore says that by then, Henry's parents had escaped their master and fled to the Union lines. If the story is true, the couple had a ferocious desire for freedom. Federal and Confederate raiders waged bitter guerrilla warfare all along Alabama's northern border during the last years of the war. The Sweets would have been walking into an area where there were no clear battle lines and no obvious sanctuaries. If they did find safety, they probably would have moved with the troops, perhaps even following them back to Tuscaloosa in the spring of 1865, when the slaves the Sweets had left behind finally won their freedom. Henry had been born in Alabama on December 16, 1865, a child of freedom. For the next quarter century, the Sweets simply faded from view, lost in the official record until the 1880s, by which time they had followed the railroad to Florida. Tall, thin, and rangy, Henry was the sort of young man who would never fill out, no matter how many years he spent working the fields. If Florida law hadn't maintained such a strict division of black and white, he would have been classified as a mulatto. His light brown skin, sharply drawn features, and wavy black hair put him as close to the American concept of white as black. Maybe Dora was drawn to his looks, maybe to his maturity. He was eight years her senior. Maybe she loved the fact that he shared her determination to make a mark. It was impossible to say where his desire came from. It might have been a reflection of his parents' flight to freedom, perhaps something else, now forgotten. But he had the businessman's drive, an entrepreneurial spirit,
fueled by a strong sense of pride and tempered by a dedication to fair dealing. Those were AME values, Dora's values. They were married in 1890 or 1891. The first few years were very hard. Dora and Henry stayed in Orlando, scraping by and putting aside whatever money they could spare. They had their first child, Oscar, in March 1893. Dora became pregnant again in early 1895. She had another boy on October 30th, 1895. They named him Ashen, a tribute to the memory of the Reconstruction governor who had made her uncle a government official, a reminder of what had been lost. Dora must have taken great pride in the name, which was surely hers to give. But the exhilaration of the moment didn't last. Eight days after Ashen's birth, Dora and Henry lost Oscar. It's almost impossible to imagine the burden that the parents bore in those terrible November days when they had to care for their newborn, so dependent, so insistent, while they buried their toddler. Hope and despair. The birthright of the baby with the radical name. At long last, land. In the summer of 1898, Henry fulfilled one of the Devon's great dreams. He bought a plot of land. It wasn't much, just a housing lot in the tidy little town of Bartow, halfway between Orlando and Tampa. It was an ordinary town, a bit newer and more prosperous than most, but just as dedicated to Jim Crow as any place in Florida. There was White Bartow, the solid, respectable center of Polk County, and there was Black Bartow, a cache of sun-baked homes separated from the center of town by the railroad tracks and the massive wall of segregation. The sweet's lot naturally set on the wrong side of the tracks. But Henry and Dora could afford it. The seller, a white man by the name of Milam, a northerner by birth, had fallen on hard times and was willing to let it go for $250. Henry put down a deposit. Dora packed up their belongings, and they headed the 50 miles west to their new home. Bartow hadn't always been sharply divided. With only 300 people in the entire county, Polk was still very much a wilderness in 1880. Bartow was a tiny trading post of 77 souls, a ramshackle collection of stores barely rising above the dog fennel that flourished in the tropical sun. Blacks and whites didn't live in harmony. Democratic Party vigilantes had operated there in the 1860s, just as they had in Leon County. But the town was too small to segregate and too far out of the way for anyone to care. Then the railroad came. When Florida Southern extended its line from Orlando to Tampa in 1884, Polk County suddenly became an attractive destination. Aspiring farmers began buying up the land, filling the long, empty fields with citrus trees and rows of vegetables. In 1889, Prospectors discovered that the river basin of the Peace River, which cut through the heart of the county, was rich with phosphate, the basic ingredient in fertilizer. European investment houses rushed to grab up the tracks with the largest deposits. By the 1890s, the land southwest of Bartow had been slashed into open pits, and the countryside shook with the roar of mill machinery, processing 20,000 tons of phosphate each and every month. Prosperity made Bartow a substantial place. By the last years of the 1890s, there were close to 3,000 people in town. The well-to-do built themselves imposing new homes, all peaks and porches, down Broadway, the elm-lined avenue that ran south toward the phosphate mines. Businessmen lined Main Street with groceries, drugstores, and specialty shops, the bicycle store, the millinery, the jewelers, the telegraph office, all housed in handsome clabbered and brick buildings fronted by wooden sidewalks and glistening white streets paved with phosphate stone. The new courthouse set at the corner of Main and Central, the new high school 
a few blocks to the south, both of them brick-and-mortar proclamations of Bartow's public prominence. There were many more black faces as well. They were drawn there by the ample work on the railroad, on the land, or in the mines. A man could make a living in Polk County. He might even hammer out a measure of the independence so many black folks wanted. But it just wouldn't do to have blacks mingling with whites, especially given Bartow's new importance. So, as the town fathers put in the sewer lines, the street lights, and the telephone exchange, they split the town in half. The few blacks who had been able to vote in the 1870s and 1880s were barred by the poll tax. Only whites voted by the 1890s, and they always elected Democrats. Blacks weren't welcome in the Orange Hotel, the Opera House, or the Main Street stores. They couldn't attend the outdoor entertainments, the county fair in March, the occasional traveling shows, except on specially designated colored days. They couldn't pray in the fine white churches. They couldn't bury their dead in the white cemetery. But all those prohibitions weren't sufficient. Just about the same time the Sweets wagon rumbled into town, Bartow officials pushed segregation to its logical conclusion. Blacks couldn't even live among whites. Those who owned land in the center of town, including some of Bartow's founders, would have to sell their homes and move to the other side of the railroad tracks, to the subdivision Florida Southern had laid out ten years earlier, to the other Bartow. Forced to separate, the people of East Bartow built a thriving community for themselves, poorer than the white side of town, to be sure, but every bit as solid and respectable. Black businessmen opened general stores, barbershops, and restaurants along Wabash Avenue, which became the black downtown. Lawrence Brown, a part-time Bible salesman, built a small real estate empire, selling home sites to black customers from the comfort of his handsome Queen Anne home on 2nd Avenue. East Bartow filled with social clubs and vibrant black churches. Mount Gilboa Missionary Baptist Church on Laurel. Burkett Chapel on 3rd. St. James AME a block over. Its grand bell tower rising above the neighborhood. The suites made themselves into pillars of the community. Their lot set at the corner of 8th and Bay Streets, almost as far from White Bartow as could be. Henry set himself to work building a house, a single-story wood-frame home constructed from the local pine, bounded on two sides by covered porches that sheltered the inside from the noonday sun. Town officials didn't extend utilities into the black neighborhood, so the suite's home had no electricity, no running water, and no indoor plumbing. Henry added a barn for the mules he used to break the land he rented beyond the woods to the south. He built coops for the chickens, Dora raised. He marked off a garden plot where they grew vegetables that filled the family table. And he began building a commercial farm, a farm that could make some money and set his family on its course. It was endless work. Henry would spend days behind the plow preparing the fields for planting. Then there'd be months of tending the cabbages, kale, rutabagas and peas, hoping that rains would come when they were needed and that the sun wouldn't burn the plants before they could be harvested. He'd sell what he could in the neighborhood. He'd load the mule cart with produce and ride up and down the streets calling out, Cabbages! in a sing-song voice that might bring the ladies out of their houses to take a look at what he had to offer. The bulk of his produce, he'd haul the 45 miles to Tampa, where the market was bigger and the price is better. Dora, meanwhile, did the constant round of chores the house required. There was the daily grind of floors to sweep, chickens to feed, meals to prepare, and pots to scrub. There were always clothes to mend and clean. On laundry day, she would have to haul up gallon after gallon of water from the small lake near her husband's fields. And more and more, there were babies to tend. Otis was born in 1899, Deloka, the first daughter, a year later. There were a few years without a newborn, 
but then Dora was almost continually pregnant. Henry was born in 1904, Parthenia in 1905, Nordica in 1907, Buck in 1908, Cynthia in 1909. Sherman, the tenth and last child, arrived in 1915. The farmhouse groaned under the weight of the family. But Henry and Dora fused the children into a unit, just as her father's generation had done back in Leon County. As soon as they were old enough, the children were expected to work. The younger ones could care for the animals, gathering the eggs, milking the cows, driving the few head of cattle up from the pasture to the barn each night. And Dora would send them into the woods to pick fruit for canning or to brighten a meal, though the rattlesnakes the children found there terrified them. Oshin and Otis gradually took over the plowing from their father. But Henry was too much of an entrepreneur to rest. As the boys freed him from the fields, he opened a lumber yard on his land as one more venture, one more way to bring the family a few precious dollars he could use to expand his operation. The Sweets thought of success in financial terms. Henry was too much of a businessman not to believe that hard work paid dividends. But money wasn't the only goal. Henry and Dora were honest, upright people. They wouldn't drink or smoke. They saved what money they could. They strived to live the solidly respectable life the church had taught them to cherish. Every Sunday after services at St. James, the sweets would put their round of chores aside. Dora would set the finest table. The china set she somehow pieced together, a freshly ironed tablecloth, a vase of newly cut flowers. The family would sit for a formal meal of the sort served in the grand homes on the other side of town. As they passed platters of food, the family would talk of the past and the future. Sometimes their grandfather would come over from Orlando to join them, and he'd tell tales of his childhood in slavery. Sometimes Dora and Henry would lecture on responsibilities. Owning land was a wonderful thing, the great triumph of Henry's generation, but as the AME had taught them, land wasn't enough. The children had to have an education, they said, to take their schooling as far as it would go. For when they reached adulthood, they were duty-bound by their church, by the struggles of the generations that went before them to be models of Christian virtue and race pride, and only education could give them the tools they needed. The children learned the lessons well, there wasn't a hint of rebellion. Not one of them challenged the course their parents set for them. If all of the sweet children were willing to take up their burdens, though, Ashen assumed the greatest weight. He was the oldest, after all, and he would have to blaze the trail for the rest. The others would depend on him, not simply as an example, but also as the person who could give them the aid they'd need as they tried to fulfill Mama and Papa's exhortations. And he knew, how could he not know, that his parents were also counting on him to prove them right and to make them proud. He was their hope. Their aspirations were his obligations. But the sweet's aspirations were inexorably consumed by Jim Crow. In the early 1890s, before the family arrived in town, black children had no school. The town fathers saw no need for it. It seems to me that attempt at general education of the Negroes is an injury rather than a benefit to the race, explained one of Bartow's leading lights. It tends to pervert his intelligence to a dissatisfaction of his natural and moral condition in life. The pastor of St. James A.M.E., however, refused to accept such an affront to his community. He tried to establish a church-run school, but his congregation simply didn't have enough money to keep the building open. Finally, the year before the suites arrived, St. James's elder struck a deal with the town. The church bought a lot in East Bartow and paid for the construction of a grade school, Union Academy, which it then deeded to town officials to operate. The devil was in the details. 
state law mandated that white and black schools be separate but equal. But white officials across the state starved black schools of funding. Bartow officials were no exception. Although there were almost as many black as white children in Bartow, the town gave Union Academy only half the appropriation they gave to the white grade schools and far less than they gave to the high school. In its earliest days, the academy could barely afford to keep its doors open. The suite's first full year in town, black children attended school an average of 27 days. The situation had improved a bit by the time Ashen started school. The academy was open four months, and there was more than one teacher, but the education was still rudimentary. The children learned to read and write, something many of their parents could not do. They were taught basic mathematics. They memorized a bit of history and some snatches of literature. But when the curriculum was completed at the end of eighth grade, the children had nowhere to go but the fields and the phosphate mines. White Bartow had a high school, of course, a wonderful new school, the pride of the community. Students entered the building through a broad veranda reminiscent of the finest antebellum plantation homes. Double windows six feet high flooded the classrooms with light. A large library filled one corner of the first floor, a laboratory another. An auditorium ran the entire length of the second floor. There was a 30-foot-long stage at one end, complete with footlights and curtains, where the students could perform and lectures could be held. With the completion of our new building, the principal told Bartow's newspaper, we are as well provided with building accommodations as any town in the state. But Ashen and his siblings weren't allowed in the doors. It would have been illegal for the sweet children to sit next to white boys and girls, and the good folks of Bartow always did their best to obey the law. Unless they chose not to. Anti-black terrorism hadn't ended when Reconstruction collapsed. Florida Democrats couldn't very well unleash violence during their election campaigns, then expect it to stop as soon as their victory was secure. Office holders were beholden to the thugs who beat black people into silence. Sometimes the thugs and the office holders were one and the same. Violence wasn't just a political tool, though. It was a way of life under Jim Crow. Whites learned to have hair-trigger tempers, if a black person caused the slightest offense, anything at all would do. Whites felt free to lash out. It was a right slaveholders once had claimed. Now any white person enjoyed the same privilege. When Ashen was a boy, the violence escalated to pathological proportions. There were reasons for the upsurge. Decades of sweeping economic change had stripped many Southern whites of the security and independence they'd once enjoyed. In the 1890s, a stunning new political insurgency, the populist movement, sought to rally and battle whites in an assault on the economic order the Democrats had built, even if that meant, as it did in some states, seeking out the support of colored men as well. Desperate to beat back the populist threat, Democrats tried to redirect whites' anger away from their party and toward their erstwhile colored allies. It was a shockingly bitter campaign, playing on whites' deepest fears of moral decay, economic impotence, and sexual inadequacy. Blacks were poised to attack, speakers proclaimed, to steal honest white men's hard-won gains, to strip them of political power, to rape their women. I have three daughters, proclaimed the most fearsome of the demagogues, South Carolina's one-eyed governor, Ben Tillman. But so help me God, I had rather find either one of them killed by a tiger or a bear and gather up her bones and bury them than to have her crawl to me and tell me the horrid story that she'd been robbed of the jewel of her maidenhood by a black fiend. Facing such an imminent threat, no decent white man could desert the party of white supremacy. It was a wholly irrational appeal, politics in its most degraded form, and it worked. As populism crumbled, 
darkness descended on the South. Whites waited in fear and anticipation for outrages to begin. Even the rumor of an incident could drive whites into a frenzy of violence, an orgy of retaliation. Bartow's descent into barbarism began in the phosphate mines. Few white men would take the brutally hard work, breaking stones with pick and axe, sun up to sundown, six or seven days a week. So the mine owners hired large numbers of young, single black men, desperate enough to work for a dollar a day. The companies packed the workers into squalid mining camps, rows of wooden shacks, sitting sullenly in the mud. But for all the rank exploitation they faced, the workers also built a world for themselves. It was a rough, often brutal world, built around the lobbies, the juke joints, blind tigers, and brothels that ring the camps. Come Saturday night, the streets pulsed with life. Miners sat on the porches, drinking and gambling. Prostitutes leaned in the doorways of the shanties, waiting for customers. The music poured out of the bars. You don't know Polk County like I do, the bluesman sang. Anybody been there, tell you the same thing, too. Whites were fascinated. The perverse alchemy of American race relations was changing the excluded into the alluring. At the same time, though, the allure simply heightened the terror whites felt. It is said that the life of a decent white man who ventures into these lobbies is in his hands, a reporter warned in 1895. The awful crimes of Negroes against whites that rouse South Carolina are increasing throughout South Florida, and it goes without saying that it is owing to the presence of large numbers of Negroes, lawless, unbridled, and drawing large cash wages with every means at their disposal for expending the same in riot and debauchery. White Bartow responded to the threat in the camps by sanctioning the most extreme forms of violence. In January 1899, a black laborer at the Land Pebble Mine dared to argue with his foreman, who pulled out a pistol and shot the laborer dead. The foreman turned himself in to the Bartow sheriff, but the sheriff brushed the incident aside. Everyone knew what had happened, he said. The foreman should go back to work. Given such license, mob violence was almost inevitable. A black worker, Sam Smith, killed a white man during an altercation at the Kingsford Phosphate Mine in June 1900. He tried to flee, but a posse tracked him down, hiding in a black Masonic lodge not far from the mine. Sheriff's deputies began to bring him back to Bartow, but when a crowd waylaid them, the deputies quickly surrendered the suspect. The whites bound him to a post and riddled him with bullets. In May 1903, a white man was murdered at one of the blind tigers operating outside the camps. A mob marched on the bar, captured the owner and his two bodyguards, and hung them from the gnarled mulberry tree that curved over the train station nearest the mine, a short walk west of Bartow. Officials actually impaneled a grand jury to investigate the slaughter, but it dismissed the crime as justified. The blind tiger was an abomination and a curse, the jurors said, and repeated efforts had been made to have said curse removed, but to no avail. How could the murder of a white man at such a place not be avenged? East Bartow's respectable black folk tried to insulate themselves from the violence of the mining camps. They agreed with local whites that the camps were a terrible stain on the town. They joined them in church campaigns to suppress drinking, gambling, and fornicating. They demanded reform, but their efforts were in vain. Jim Crow didn't discriminate between good Negroes and bad Negroes. Every black person was suspect. Every community open to assault. No one was safe. The violence broke out on a glistening morning in May 1901. A white woman, Rena Taggart, the young wife of the town baker was fishing off the Peace River Bridge, less than a mile east of the suite's home, when someone dragged her into the thick brush lining the banks. 
A black man working a short way down river heard screams and rushed to town for help. A contingent of whites raced to the scene, but Taggart was gone. It took them 45 minutes to find her body, half buried in the mud of a nearby swamp. She had been raped and her throat had been cut. In a fury, the whites interrogated the black man who had summoned them. He couldn't have seen much. He was a distance away, and the riverbanks were thick with foliage that time of year. But he said enough to convince his interrogators that Taggart had been murdered by Fred Rochelle, a light-skinned 16-year-old Negro who roomed with his sister in East Bartow while working, like other members of his family, in the phosphate pits. With the interrogation complete, the whites marched en masse to the sister's home. But Rochelle was gone, fled into the swampland south of town. It was an incredibly dangerous moment. More and more whites were gathering as the news spread. As they had no suspect in hand, no one to punish for the outrage. East Bartow's political leaders, including several trustees of St. James AME, desperately tried to distance themselves from the crime. Frantically, they drafted a public declaration condemning Rochelle and proclaiming solidarity with the white mob forming in the streets. We, the colored citizens of this community, they wrote, must say that it is a shame and disgrace to our race to allow such brutish conduct as Taggart's rape and murder to occur. We should shoulder arms and march to the front and show to our white citizens that we do not uphold such conduct as this. Just to think that a white woman can't go out for air and exercise or fishing without being accosted by a brutish Negro. Colored families like the Sweets, meanwhile, must have been shuttering themselves inside their homes, barring their doors and windows, readying their rifles, waiting for the pogrom to begin. Rochelle's flight may well have saved East Bartow from destruction. By mid-afternoon, the mine managers had sent their bloodhounds to town, and most of the able-bodied white men were organizing into posses to begin the manhunt. They spent the night and most of the following day scouring the countryside, vainly trying to pick up Rochelle's trail. Finally, late in the afternoon of the second day, three local black men found him hiding near the phosphate pits a few miles southwest of town. They turned him over to some passing whites who marched him back to Bartow. Three hundred townspeople gathered in front of the courthouse to see Rochelle's return. While the sheriff and his deputies stood by, the town's best men interrogated him. He confessed to every detail. The throng decided he should be returned to the scene of the crime. First, they brought him by the victim's house, where her stepfather asked that nothing be done until all of the posses were back from the hunt. Then, they marched the victim through the empty streets of East Bartow to the bridge. The mob's leaders delayed until 7 p.m., White witnesses said that Rochelle showed no emotion during the ordeal. But the wait must have been agonizing. A 16-year-old standing before his executioners, the minutes ticking away, the fear rising and rising. Finally, Bartow's leading citizens placed the young man on a hogshead of flammable material and chained him to a tree. They stacked bone-dry wood around the base, poured gasoline on the pile, and invited the victim's husband to apply the flame. He touched a match to the kindling a few minutes after eight o'clock. The hog's head ignited into a fierce bonfire. Eight minutes later, Rochelle was dead, and the members of the mob began drifting back to their homes. By midnight, the newspaper reported, the town was as peaceful as ever. There would be other mobs, on Christmas Eve, 1903, a group of whites tried to lynch a black man imprisoned in the Bartow jail, but the sheriff held them off. Two black prisoners were lynched in Bartow in 1906, and mob violence raced through Polk County in 1909. Two blacks were immolated in February when a suspicious fire burned down the jail in a nearby phosphate town. A few weeks later, Whites in the town of Lakeland, just north of Bartow, dragged Jack Wade from police custody, hung him from a tree, and riddled his writhing body with bullets. In April, 
a Bartow mob lynched Charles Scarborough in a chilling reprise of the rape frenzy eight years earlier. As appalling as these events were, though, Ashen would always remember Fred Rochelle's death as the most terrifying moment of his young life. As an adult, he'd tell people that he had witnessed the entire scene, that he'd hidden in the bushes near the bridge and watched the burning. He'd recount it with frightening specificity, the smell of the kerosene, Rochelle's screams as he was engulfed in flames, the crowds picking off pieces of charred flesh to take home as souvenirs. Maybe, just maybe he did see it all. The bridge was a short walk from his home. He could have been outside coming back from his father's fields when the mob drove Rochelle through East Bartow. But he was only five years old in the summer of 1901, and it seems unlikely that Dora would have let him outside any time that day. More likely, the horrific events imprinted themselves so deeply on Ashen's mind that he convinced himself that he had been there. Either way, the effect was the same. The image of the conflagration, the heart-pounding fear of it, had been seared into his memory. Dora and Henry already knew. Maybe they talked of it in the stillness of the night after the children were asleep. Maybe they didn't talk about it at all, but they knew. Their families had struggled for two generations to get this far, to own land, to have a home no one could take from them. But it wasn't enough, not in this place, not at this time. They put off a decision as long as they could, but in the summer of 1909, they were forced to act. It was probably the coincidence of events. Ashen finished eighth grade that spring, just about the time the respectable people of Bartow left Charles Scarborough's broken body dangling from a rope. How could Dora and Henry let their son stay with them? He'd have no hope of an education, no opportunity to make his way in the world, no chance of fulfilling the dreams their family had nurtured since they'd first tasted freedom almost forty years ago. And there was the possibility, almost too horrible to contemplate, that somehow he'd be caught in the terror that so often raced through their streets. It wasn't going to be easy. They'd stressed so much the ironclad bonds of family. Ashen had become a help in the fields, vitally important to a farm family with so many young children. And he was only thirteen, still a boy. But there was nothing else to do. They would have to send him away, to a place where he could pursue his education, to a place where he'd be safe. The night before he was to depart, Ashen walked over to the parsonage of St. James A.M.E. He was scared to leave Bartow, he said, without God's blessing. So on the day of his leave, wrote his minister, Ashen gave his heart to the Lord. Then he boarded the northbound train and was gone. Chapter 3 Migration Xenia was a placid little town, like hundreds of others scattered across the fertile farmland that rolled northward from the Ohio River. A string of shop fronts lined Main and Detroit streets, forming a town square around the county courthouse, its limestone facade shining in the sun. Xenia had touches of urban life. A few small factories, a handful of saloons, dark and mysterious, and a smattering of foreign-born workmen to fill them both. But the town moved with the rhythms of the countryside, gray winters giving way to early springs, blistering summers to muted autumns. As he stepped down from the train at Xenia Depot in the first week of September 1909, Ashen Sweet might have found it comforting to see a town that was surprisingly so much like the one he'd left behind. But he hadn't traveled a thousand miles in search of what was familiar. He had come to Xenia to take his place in a new world, free of Jim Crow's oppression. Ashen had been given strict orders about what to do. He was to arrive in daylight, not in darkness. But even if the weather were clear, he was not to leave the station on his own. Instead, he was to find the telephone exchange and ring the college office to request a conveyance. Dad Harris 
the venerable maintenance man, would bring his wagon around. Ashen and any other students could put their belongings, clothes, bedding, and Bibles into the back and scramble aboard for the three-mile ride through the east side where Xenia's Negroes lived. Out of town, they traveled down curving country roads 